I'm very happy to uh, welcome you all for this uh, webinar. I'm myself, uh, Xavier Pasco. I'm the director of the uh, Foundation for Strategic Research uh, here in France. And uh, uh, we are very happy to uh, welcome you all for this uh, annual conference on, of our research program about um, Japan, and uh, which has been uh, supported for many years now by our Japanese partners. I and mean, we are very, um, of course, very happy to uh, to work in cooperation uh, with our Japanese partners on these uh, very important issues. Uh, this program, I could remind you, is uh, composed by different uh, webinars, and and this uh, particular event is uh, is especially important for us because it's, uh, I would say, the flagship of the program uh, of this uh, with this annual conference. Um, so. Um, this webinar is devoted uh, uh, this year to uh, um, the security in the Indo-Pacific under the dual challenge of uh, China and Russia. And of course, um, we will have three successive roundtables devoted to these uh, um, general topics with different angles. I just want to uh, let you know that we will have this uh, uh, this roundtable will be held in a successive manner. We won't have a break. Uh, we have to, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, realize that we have a lot of time difference, and we don't want to have uh, to um, our Japanese friends uh, uh, to be uh, uh, leaving this uh, webinar too late for them. So we will uh, keep this in a very uh, uh, um, uh, concise and, 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 and but still very dense uh, manner. Um, I'm uh, also very happy to. Uh, uh, open now the, the first round table we will have, and which is more devoted, which is have a focus on the uh, Taiwan uh, uh, Straits area, let's say. And uh, um, we have, uh, I think it's it's quite uh, um, important to start this uh, uh, this conference by uh, having a look uh, uh, to this uh, to this area. Uh, for sure, for the last months, what we can see that. Uh, Japan uh, seems to be entering a new era in terms of, uh, of security. And of course, the national security strategy that has been published uh, recently uh, is a very important document in this respect. And it reflects, of course, uh, uh, an even, even more stressed environment over the last years and months. Uh, we all have this uh, idea of, uh, of um, uh, having the Chinese ships cruising uh, close to the Senkakus. Just a small uh, housekeeping remark, and for all our uh, audience, uh, you can use your Q&A button, of course, to, to ask questions to our panelists, and I will, uh, as a moderator, will reflect during this first roundtable your questions to, to, the, to the panelists. Um, so I was mentioning these uh, uh, Chinese movements that, of course, increase the tension in the area. We have a, a number of uh, of um, uh, missiles that have been tested and sometimes falling in the uh, uh, exclusive economic zone of, of Japan. And so, so this focus on the threat uh, security, I would say, is of course very much relevant uh, to the uh, topics we have today. Uh, uh, we understand that this uh, uh, reflection on, on, on security in Japan has been also exacerbated by the current situation in Ukraine, and, and uh, clearly uh, providing food for thought, I would say, uh, uh, for envisioning a high intensity, high intensity events in, 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 in Asia. And, and there's an apparent conviction that Japan needs to take a more determined uh, approach to its security, um, of course, for itself, also for convincing allies in the area, uh, because of course, there will be a mix of autonomous, uh, certainly efforts and also uh, cooperation is, is obviously uh, uh, very important. Um, three elements, and I will then uh, give the floor to our panelists to see if uh, uh, they agree with this. Um, three elements, I think, this new posture, a posture change in terms of capabilities, of course. And I noticed that some capabilities would be spread from uh, mainland Japan down to the uh, 100 miles or some, or some some somewhat uh, of the coast of Taiwan. So a, re a reorganization of this, a new command structure, uh, permanent joint command, uh, more coordination with the US, and also a spending surge, I would say, 
uh, with the figure of 2% of the GDP that's been quoted as an objective for 2027. Uh, 20, uh, so all this also will, will create more complexity, certainly, uh, on the side of Japan. And it would be very interesting to hear uh, uh, the contributions on this. Uh, though it will have to be a sustained effort, certainly. So there's a lot of questions surrounding this all reshaping on, on security conditions in Japan, and of course, with a special view on, on the, the Taiwan threat. Um, so I will, uh, I will uh, uh, now give the floor uh, to uh, our um, uh, panelists, and uh, we'll uh, with Mr. Um, uh, 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 ta Takamizawa first. Uh, who is uh, uh, currently Professor uh, Takamizawa is, is currently a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo. And uh, uh, he served as an ambassador to Japan to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva uh, from December 2016 to January 2020. And he so worked uh, for three years uh, for the cabinet secretary as an assistant chief cabinet uh, um, secretary and deputy secretary general of the national Security Secretariat, Director General of the National Center for Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity. Uh, and he had a lot of uh, other uh, official functions. So I'm very, very happy uh, maybe to start the discussion uh, to uh, uh, give the word uh, to uh, Professor Takamizawa. Uh, Professor Takamizawa, you have the, you have the floor. I'll just make uh, several points. That uh, first, that we have to look seriously, take a serious look at what has changed since the past three uh, cross-strait uh, crises. So, I, I would like to uh, point out five points uh, with regard to that point. Uh, first, is the uh, increasing military power, and second, is an increased conf confidence of Chinese leadership and Chinese people. And third is a kind of the accumulation of taboo breaking successes by Xi Jinping. Yeah. The, uh, the third is a uh, increased Xi, Xi Jinping's autocratic leadership. And five is uh, the Ch Chinese increased influence power. So we have seen a very different, I think, picture from the previous three uh, crises in, in relation to even the latest crises. So that, that, that's uh, we need to take a look at. And with regard to Taiwan and US, Japan, Australia, India, uh, and Europe, there are so many di different points. But uh, I think what is really challenging for the for the coming uh, years will be a uh, challenge of integration and uh, and also the uh, vulnerability of democracies. So I, I think uh, the destabilizing factors or risks will be first a misunderstanding uh, or a difference of interpretation. And second, maybe a lack of uh, communication. And thirdly, lack of integration among uh, the like-minded countries and, and so forth, and also loss of trust and confidence. So it's really difficult to see the good good aspect. Of, but the uh, it seems to me that the international situation seems to be bottoming out. Uh, so it, it's really uh, hard. Uh, and so uh, we, we should be, uh, we should never give up a kind of uh, the chance of bottoming out. And so what, what we need to do is uh, five, first, the strategic messaging and dialogue in an integrated manner, and second, maybe maintain or recover a comprehensive national power or integration power within ourselves. Yeah, and these are the points that I, I should have made at the outset of the discussion. So I think, uh, uh, and also, we need to find out some joint projects uh, to save the earth with, uh, with uh, China, and uh, I'm not sure to what extent we can do that. but. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, Japan and, and Europe uh, and US uh, uh, needs to kind of establish in a seamless 24-7 uh, uh, integrated, I think, uh, policy coordination channels and uh, information sharing uh, uh, in, in a cross-domain uh, manner, and which the uh, uh, late, latest uh, released uh, uh, US-Japan uh, 2 plus 2 statement uh, is, is talking about. I think uh, that's really uh, challenging, but, but we can do that because we have accumulated our experience through Ukraine and also 
capacity building collaboration in, in Asia. So I think uh, we have an, a kind of uh, well-established habit of cooperation. So we need to apply that kind of good relations for uh, different purposes uh, and mutually reinforcing, I think, uh, in Indo-Pacific and uh, EU and NATO collaboration. I think that, that is really needed. And uh, that's, that's the best way to deal with the risks uh, in the cross trades, but I, I see that the positive aspect we will be bottoming out uh, sometime soon if we are united and we continue to make uh, extra efforts to make things better. Thank you. Uh, I, I my deep deepest apologies for all. Thank you for giving me a time. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Xavier. Uh, and meanwhile, I will ask, um, I, I'm sure she hears me, Jeanne Morcos, who is in charge with me of that program to try to reach Professor Takamizawa by, uh, by uh, mail to ask him uh, if he has any issues with uh, the Zoom link, but I, I think he was there a few minutes ago. Uh, so yes, I will begin. Uh, and this is the first panel of this conference, uh, there, there will be three, as you said, uh, three round tables, is focusing on the Taiwan Strait. Um, as we know, uh, the Taiwan Strait has been the focus of many, many, um, you know, um, strategic interest, uh, not only in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in Japan, but uh, in the US and everywhere. And the, uh, the main um, position seems to be in the region at least uh, to say that, uh, and this is a, a kind of mantra or slogan that you hear a lot in Taiwan too, is uh, Ukraine today is Asia tomorrow. Uh, so the Ukraine war really plays a role, played a role of wake up call uh, for all the region and um, beyond the region, of, to, of course, the United States. But I, I, maybe I will uh, focus on a few points that are a little bit less um, um, focused on and a little bit uh, contradictory, contradictory, maybe, with uh, the main uh, way of thinking in the region. China is a threat. I completely agree with that posture, and everybody who knows me um, would agree with with with, uh, with that. Uh, China is a threat. It's a very compl complex, complicated threat. In Japan, we talk a lot about gray zone risk. These are huge, uh, very important point because it's extremely difficult to respond. Uh, with military capabilities because it could lead to wars and it needs a lot of mobilization constantly. This is what Japan is facing around the Senkaku Islands, but this is also what Taiwan is facing with these um, uh, increasing uh, maneuvers and exercises that uh, uh, China is doing almost every day with plane in uh, Taiwanese A. AZ uh, ID, but also uh, we saw that in a larger scale uh, when Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi visited Taiwan, or only a few years ago, where more than uh, almost 70 uh, Chinese planes crossed the middle line of the Taiwan Strait. So there is an increase of this demonstration. I would say gesticulation. I don't know if it's the right word in English, but you know, military gesticulation to show that China is indeed extremely impressive, has capabilities. And this is part of a kind of what Ch the Chinese stress is a psychological war. Exactly what we see, like <clears throat> I put on Facebook this morning, there was um, an article by uh, on the Global Times, the nationalist newspapers in China, <clears throat> that stressed the fact that uh, with this increased uh, cooperation between, uh, I mean, the Japan-US alliance has, is nothing new, but the increased capabilities of the Japanese self-defense forces and the new budget, uh, <clears throat> Japan now is positioning itself, according to mainland China, to the PRC, as a kind of target, you know, uh, a sacrificial uh, target to the war mongering uh, in the US uh, in East Asia. So this is, we will see a lot of this. Actually, as uh, for the real capacity for mainland China to wage a war and to conquer Taiwan, I think we have to be a little bit more realistic. And the fact that we are more realistic gives a little bit more also confidence. Of course, it doesn't mean that um, 
uh, countries in the region, starting with Taiwan, but also Japan, do not have to prepare to think about it, to think about contingencies, what to do, uh, and to be extremely vigilant about uh, China's constant effort to change the status quo by force, including in the Taiwan Strait. But Tai China today, first there is the Ukraine war. And of course, if it had been successful, and if uh, Vladimir Putin in three days or one week could have conquered Ukraine. And I think maybe this is what uh, he thought uh, the Russian army uh, was possible. Maybe this is also what Xi Jinping thought when he received him just before the war. And it would have been um, an extremely positive uh, sign for China also to demonstrate that that kind of regime can do whatever they want without any reaction from the from the West, including from the United States. Uh, we have to remember that the beginning of the Ukraine war was a few months after um, um, after the situation in Afghanistan, when uh, the US left Afghanistan. And in Chinese newspapers, you had a lot of articles concerning the weakness of the US and the weakness of the West, the fact that we couldn't do anything again. It was finished. I mean, the power, the uni, the power of the uh, the United States was almost finished, um, and so they were extremely surprised by the reaction in uh, the United States after the war, war on Ukraine. And when we see that war dragging on with, without any success for Russia, I think it 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 it's played the role of a kind of wake up call for China also. And they realized that whatever the delusion, delusion, uh, delusion sorry, Xi Jinping may have concerning the strengths of the PLA, uh, they must have realized that to launch an offensive against Taiwan um, would not be such an easy thing to do. And especially because, as we all know, there is a strait between Taiwan and the mainland, and it's almost 200 kilometers, and there are not so many places where you can land. And when we speak of a blockers, many people speak of a possible blockers of the strait. The first victim of a blockers of the strait would be China itself, because 90% of the traffic in the strait goes or comes from Chinese ports. So, this is not such an easy thing. However, focusing on the risk of a war um, <clears throat> in the Taiwan Strait um, plays also maybe a welcome um, role, welcome role, uh, a, a positive role in convincing people in Japan that yes, there is an alliance and the um, US engagement and uh, protection. But for many years now, Japanese strategists have been thinking about, you know, reassurance, what would the US really do? And um, indeed, there is an expectation on the US side too that Japan does more for its own defense. And this is a debate we know very well in Europe because this is a kind of debate uh, there was concerning the Germany's, for instance, where the position is very close to, to the position of Japan or other European states, because even though there is a NATO in Europe, there was there is a, a strong expectation in the US uh, and in the framework of NATO, of course, for uh, European countries to contribute more to their own defense, particularly in terms of uh, fi um, financing the defense. Uh, and we saw that uh, again in, in Germany. So this is what Japan has been facing for years, expectations from the US. So, and so, so the decision uh, to, to Possibly, because it's not decided, I mean, it's not financed yet, and it, this is a huge debate in Japan, to possibly rise the Japanese budget to 2% uh, uh, in 2027, and also to acquire the possibility to strike, longer range strike, to, to strike a missile bases, uh, but conditions are extremely complicated and you know there are a lot of debate of you know it's not a preemptive it's not a preemptive strike it has to be against an imminent strike so you need capabilities that Japan do not have now they need I mean they absolutely need to coordinate with the US so all these are very important issues and necessary ones 
There is also the issue of what to do if there is a, a problem, an incident in the Taiwan Strait about uh, the US being able to use its own bases in Japan. It is not automatic. They have to coordinate with the Japanese government to say the least. So I think that um, all these issues, the Japan has been able to go forward on this because of the focus on a quasi imminent war in Taiwan. And this is also, this is a real threat. We have to, I mean, China needs to be deterred. Uh, if nothing is done, I'm sure that it, if China thinks they have the capability to do it, they will do something against Taiwan. But uh, it is also extremely important in order to convince, for instance, the population in Japan that Japan needs to move forward in terms of defense. I don't know if Mr. Um, my co-speaker has arrived. No. <laughs> so we have an Not issue. Yet, I think. Uh, we have an issue here. Yes. Um, I think, I think uh, we still can discuss. Uh, we, I think uh, maybe we can uh, discuss uh, this. Um, I will encourage. And I questions. just would like to add something as I have a little bit more time. Yes. I just would like to, to add some points about uh, China's capabilities. Uh, we, 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 we talk a lot about uh, when you compare the budgets, for instance, uh, uh, Chinese budget has been constantly increasing and it's now around $270 billion. It's huge. It's the second one, one in the world uh, after the United States. There, there is uh, still um, uh, a gap, but uh, but uh, there is still a gap, uh, but um, but it's a huge budget. Uh, but we have to, and of course, uh, China's uh, production system uh, is able to produce a lot of planes, ships, uh, and it's extremely in impressive. Now we have the third uh, aircraft carrier. And there is also a symbolic value to all these things. I mean, just look at the propaganda movie of the PLA. Uh, we can see, you can see a lot of them on uh, on internet. And it's absolutely fascinating to see how they, see, they, they want to project the image of an army that is actually an old image. I mean, it's, a, I mean, strong, tall soldiers, uh, well-dressed. Um, it's a war like uh, the Second World War in a way. I mean, but China uh, in recent years, uh, and even since 1949 almost, has no experience of what is war today. Um, and especially a war where you have to cross a strait and you have to to be able to perfectly um, use joint operations and common and control must be a plus space. And you know, there are a lot of new, so they publish a lot on these things, usually translating things published in the United States, but it's still like a kind of war game and a video game almost. Uh, and it's not real war. And again, they have no experience of what it is. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not dangerous because China can get intoxicated into its own powerful you know, image of uh, a PLA ready for fighting, as uh, Xi Jinping says very often. But PLA, uh, I'm not sure it's ready to fight the kind of war that we see today, especially with the involvement of the United States in, t in terms of information, cyber, space, targeting, and so on. We see now with Ukraine that the US are perfectly able to strongly support an ally, quasi ally or ally, without losing people on the on the in the field and it was a long term uh, argument from uh, mainland china uh, that uh, the us would never intervene to support taiwan because they don't want it's a zero debt policy and they don't want to risk the lives of americans for that except if you and this is an issue we have with russia too if you rise the ante up to the threat veiled threat of China being a nuclear power. And this is also China always did without saying it. They say we do not use first, I mean, no first use of nuclear capabilities. But still, behind a lot of thinking, you see that 
what can they do against us because we are a nuclear power? So this is a dimension that has to be taken into account too. And the last point is that China is facing now, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure it will stop very soon, huge internal difficulties, including Xi Jinping. I don't know what is the posture or position of Xi Jinping right now, vis-a-vis -vis his colleagues at the top of the CCP, but China is facing a huge economic issues war will completely destroy Chinese economy for many reasons. And also, as we all know, the COVID crisis is not finished and it's causing a lot of uh, turmoil and um, opposition inside China itself. So uh, let's uh, put it here. Okay. Maybe we can uh, try to exchange and discuss. Yes, absolutely. I, I just wanted to comment a bit on your last point, uh, Valérie. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned this uh, uh, question about the U.S. involvement. Um, and I would say it's, it's interesting both for China and Japan, in a sense, because uh, you rightly mentioned that China had the idea that this zero days thing you are, well, what might be an incentive for China to act. Uh, uh, but also um, when they see what happens in, the, in Ukraine with the support from the U.S. from afar, I would say, um, they might revise this. But I had also a question, and maybe for our Japanese uh, friends, by the way, but maybe also for you, uh, uh, Valerie, of course. When I see this, I was mentioning the security effort in Japan, and I had um, um, maybe two related questions, and, and at least interrogations for myself uh, related to this effort. The first one is, um, we see that there's a mix of um, a quest for autonomy, but also uh, an interest for reinforcing cooperation with the US. And we see that in uh, as parallel tracks, I would say, whether it's about capabilities, whether it's about uh, the new joint command. I, I also saw that there was this project of having a, a US Marine littoral regiment uh, in Okinawa, for example, and other things. And we see that these things go hand in hand. And, and my, my question would be how much um, political debate exists about how to uh, 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 tune the mix, you know, between um, reassert, reasserting Japanese autonomy in this field on the one hand, and also reinforcing or maybe developing or maybe updating cooperation with the US on the other hand. And I, I feel like it's not a zero sum <laughs> game, it's a positive sum game, it's something that goes. It's not mutually exclusive. So I would like to have some uh, ideas on how the debate has been structured in Japan on this on the one hand, and also what I, and consequently, uh, and related to what you just said about China, I wanted to, I was wondering about how much of this security thinking happening right now in Tokyo is uh, tailored to face this Taiwan issue. Or is it, um, I, I, I see that it's a large, large scale defensive reshaping in a sense, but it feels like this reshaping is mostly focused, but maybe I'm mistaken here, I'm misguided here, and is mostly focused on this uh, South China Sea, Taiwanese, Senkaku <laughs> area. So I was wondering about these two things. So the mix between autonomy and US cooperation on the one hand, and on the other hand, how the capability thinking is been mainly focused on this Taiwanese issue. I don't know, Valérie, if you want to yeah, um, tell maybe, Japanese uh, friends or so. Uh, yes, please, Valérie. Yes, maybe because um, as Mr. Taka Izawa is, uh, is yeah. not here, and uh, I would not like to uh, uh, annoy Mr. Isobe unless he wants to intervene into uh, speaking on, 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 on an issue that is not the one he was focusing on. But maybe uh, Isobe-san, if you hear me, if you want to, to say something, please do it, but do not feel obliged to do it. <laughs> it's just... Uh, and uh, actually, um, or Mr. Uh, Shinyo also, if you are here, you can also uh, intervene. Um, please uh, do, do that. Um, I will just first, in terms of autonomy and um, you know, and um, relation uh, be with uh, difference uh, relations with the United States. I'm not sure Japan is thinking. Um, it depends. There are some circles of strategists in Japan who really would like Japan to see 
to be more autonomous in terms of capacity and um, for its own defense. Um, first, I'm not at all sure this is uh, the position of uh, the general public in Japan. Uh, that is, and for instance, it's a very interesting point. So in principle, it was decided that um, uh, that uh, the budget in uh, the Japanese uh, defense budget could uh, be raised raise, uh, to two percent, which was uh, one percent was never a low. Eh? It was a principle too. Uh, but uh, the debate now is about uh, actually how to finance this, and uh, and there are a lot of opposition, including in inside the main main party. I mean the leading the part the political party in Japan, the LDP. Uh, but about the issue of taxes, you know, Japan also is facing uh, economic issues like inflation and, um, you know, it's um, uh, energy prices and so on. And there is a very strong opposition to rise taxes in order to finance that budget. And uh, so the, they found a solution in, you know, maybe they will switch some budget for the um, Coast Guard, for instance, or research and development, and put it under the defense budget to in order to to go up to two percent. But actually, it will be the same kind of, uh, of course, some increase, but uh, basically the same kind of uh, spending without uh, rising taxes. Uh, and it will also, also, of course, raise a lot of issues because it's not sure there is a silo mentality. Uh, everywhere but in Japan very strong so I'm not sure but the Coast Guard want to be put under the budget of the defense so I, I foresee a lot of long debates on this issue but the decision has been announced uh, and I think the main maybe Isobe-san or Shinyo-san can contradict me and we can discuss that. I think that in Japan, it is also extremely, the main incentive is also to reassure the US that Japan is ready to do something. So you have to raise the budget, you have to think about your defense, but all this is in coordination and all with the issue is how to guarantee US engagement to defend Japan, whatever it costs. I mean, if Japan needs to do more, it will do more. I mean, it will spend more, which is a little bit different. And then when we speak about budget increase in Japan, uh, there are a lot of debates also among strategists uh, about, but to do what? And some people think that there is not enough thinking about what to do with that budget. Uh, is it only to show that Japan is doing something or do you really think about and um, then there is also as I mentioned before the issue of contingencies plan in in the situation where there is something happened in the Taiwan Strait okay. what do, does Japan do of course Japan you know if there is a war it's not a, I mean Japan is directly or indirectly threatened so Japan will, of course, allow the US to use its own bases or support the logistics to the bases, which is an issue. I mean, if they do not say yes, the US are not officially allowed to use their own bases in Japan. So uh, it's not such an easy situation. You have to think in advance about it. And uh, so this is, all these issues have not been yet completely solved. And I, I don't know if they will be solved because they are very, very related to um, public opinion, internal politics, uh, differences between different factions inside the LDP, especially after the passing of former Prime Minister uh, Abe, who was very supportive for a stronger role for Japan, but now his faction is less uh, strong and united uh, um, than before. So there are a lot of unresolved issues, but the important point for Japan today is to show that it is on the side of the US, it will do something uh, in order to get uh, support of the US. This explains uh, Prime Minister Kishida's visit in Europe and the U Northern America to prepare for the G7. This is uh, an extremely important visit. Um, but uh, we clearly see that the two main 
partners in this visit in terms of strategy and security where uh, the UK uh, in Europe and uh, the US, uh, of course, uh, uh, in the um, in, uh, United States, uh, in Northern America. Yes. And thank you, Valerie. And by the way, this is reflecting a question we have, uh, which is, what do you think of the defense partnership? The Japanese prime minister has just deepened with the U with UK and the US this week, and you just uh, answered the question in a sense. Maybe Isabel San, and, and thank you for uh, taking the floor if you like. Um, you had, a, of course, a view on this. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I just... Uh, uh, Send an email to him, uh, Mr. Takamizawa, and I exchanged the email this uh, uh, morning. So I thought that he should be in this uh, webinar, but uh, still he is not uh, present now. So uh, about the Taiwan Strait issue, uh, let me uh, show you my uh, slide. Is it okay? And yes, it's, uh, yeah. So let that, me share. I think. Yeah. Uh, Fabien, maybe you need to. Fabien, peut-être. Voilà, merci. No, 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 no. Not this one. No, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, It's not. Uh, it's not the presentation by Mr. Isobe. He just want to share uh, some view on uh, what yeah. we took uh, because Mr. Takazi is not yeah. here. So please, please. Uh, you're very welcome. Yeah, Can you see good. my slide? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes we see your oh, slide. Good. We see your slide. Okay. But, uh, uh, okay. Okay, uh, this slide is on a uh, use that the, uh, the, the dialogue with the Taiwanese uh, friends in November 30. So, mm. The agenda is the lessons learned from the Russo-Ukraine war and the Taiwan Strait issues. And the lessons learned from the war, uh, from the perspective uh, of the international politics and the military perspective, I would like to raise these uh, issues. One is that from the international politics, a P5 permanent five member state abruptly invades, invaded a neighboring country. So the dysfunction of the UN, especially the Security Council. And another aspect is the sharpening the great power competition. It means authoritarian groups and the liberal freedom group. And the new Cold War uh, is emerging. But also unstable elements uh, is also added. It is uh, like a uh, global south. Uh, the, the countries uh, of Africa or Middle East, they haven't uh, showed clear stance on Ukraine war. And lessons of international politics, efforts to establish an alternative framework to the UN are increasingly important. So for example, IPEF, the American policy, Indo-Pacific economic framework, and AUKUS, FUAD, and from the authoritarian uh, country groups, like ABRI or Shanghai cooperation organizations. So both groups are, are making efforts uh, to include uh, like-minded countries. The second one is efforts to shape international public opinion. So competition among major powers pro plus global south. And the third bullet is economic sanctions. Uh, we cannot expect to have an immediate impact or effect, but I think we will have a slow effect in economic sanctions. About the military uh, point of view, uh, I found that the, even in the 21st century, military is the decisive actor among DIME. DIME means the diplomacy, information, military, and economy. And the second is the UAV or PGM. UAV is unmanned aerial vehicle. 
and uh, precision guided missiles, they are becoming an uh, increasing threat. So for the ground troops or the surface missiles on the sea, it is getting vulnerable. Third one is fighting in new domains, first traditional domains such as artillery firing and trench war fighting. So we, I do expect that there no only ceasefire inside. Uh, not only military, but also private assets are used in the Ukrainian war, like uh, social networks and also Stalin. These private assets is becoming military tools. And the last one is the Russian army. Most of the, the world, the countries in Europe or Japan or any country expected that the Russian army is formidable, was formidable and very strong. But during this war, Russia exposed their weakness. So I think increased threat of the UAV and the PGMs. So we need to overcome vulnerabilities in terrestrial and offshore assets is critical. Second is need to be prepared for long haul even today. Sustainability, infrastructure protection, civil protection, and utilization of civil assets. Human factor is also decisive. Fighting justice, cause, and morale, discipline, unit, reserve forces. When we compare the Ukrainian forces uh, with the Russian forces, uh, Ukrainian forces are high morale and high discipline, and unity of effort is very efficient. So, oh, how about the Taiwan Strait? Comparison of the Ukraine war and Taiwan crisis. Common feature is uh, unilateral armed invasion by a P5 member of the UN Security Council. This is the common feature. But differences we have, one is that Ukraine is a sovereign state. Taiwan is a Taiwan, uh, administered by Taiwan government, but not a, a sovereign state uh, from the international perspective, international law perspective. And Ukraine is an uh, adjacent uh, country to Russia, uh, but the Taiwan is an island and uh, 110 kilometers uh, Taiwan Strait exists between Taiwan and uh, continental China. And as for the national interests of the United States, Taiwan is bigger than Ukraine, I think. The reason is two. One is that the Taiwan forms the very critical location of the first island chain. And the second is economic values. TSMC, the semiconductors uh, factories in Taiwan. So I think uh, Taiwan is very important for the US national interest. So from the military rationality, I think less probable for the time being. Time being means maybe this year or next year. I think uh, the Chinese regime leadership would rather use a non-military approach, like a hybrid warfare or the psychological warfare like that. And from the political possibilities, it depends solely on President Xi's mind. We can't predict, as we couldn't predict Putin would invade Ukraine. So background factors are uh, shown on the slide. And from the military perspective, especially the amphibious uh, operations capability of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. Uh, this is, a, I wrote a book about uh, in Japanese about uh, amphibious capabilities. So simultaneous uh, amphibious capability for the PLA is now 
they can uh, land about uh, 20,000 personnel at a time on Taiwan Island. But 20,000 means about, uh, it equals about two divisions. Only two divisions can land, so it means it is uh, defeated. It would be defeated by piecemeal uh, by the Taiwanese armed forces. So for the PLA, I think they need uh, to gain a little bit of time to augment amphibious uh, capabilities. Well, this is the uh, August PLA's uh, missile launch. And this is a precise one and uh, from the, uh, I think, Vietnamese uh, researchers, the one. I picked up this from the Twitter. So you can show that the, they launched uh, short range ballistic missiles and medium range ballistic missiles uh, around the Taiwan, but the very quite striking is that the, in the, the bottom one, uh, it is the, the straits of the, uh, between Taiwan and the Philippines. And the, actually the PLA aimed to block the Taiwan, but also they are blocking the sea lines of communications. So this is very shocking to us. Okay, so I finished my uh, presentation. Thank you. And uh, have a Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for this very, very interesting uh, comparison. Can I say a few insight. words? Yes, of course. Yes, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nikkei and uh, Ms. Pascal. Well, uh, the uh, back to your question, I think, uh, you know, whether Japan is able to, uh, you know, fight uh, or do, uh, you know, military action uh, independently, you know, uh, it depends uh, quite, uh, you know, the, uh, the situation, uh, whether you know, the uh, only Taiwan was attacked, or also the uh, Japanese bases uh, or attacked, or the US bases in Japan was attacked. So it de depends, of course, uh, very much, uh, you know, on the uh, situation. So uh, we cannot uh, simply say that, uh, you know, that we are uh, trying to be uh, independent uh, from the U US Army, you know, to uh, defend uh, Japan. No, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, and uh, still, I think we have the uh, constitutional constraints uh, even the uh, use of the uh, co uh, collective uh, right to self-defense is very much limited. You know, we just opened up slightly the uh, you know the, this limitation and, and left left uh, uh, alleviated. But uh, you know, I think uh, you know we we have still the uh, limitations, and so that uh, you know, simply ask and uh, answering to your question, I think it is not possible for Japan to 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 defend uh, alone in every case. In every case, we are doing together with the United States in accordance with the security pact. Uh, and but um, at least when Japan or Japanese, uh, you know, base or U.S. bases in Japan was attacked, of course we will be responding, you know, uh, automatically. And uh, you know, and uh, so that uh, in in this case, uh, I think it is not, not so much necessary uh, to uh, depend on the U.S. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, otherwise, I think uh, we should always, you know, be uh, consult. Uh, with the uh, United States, and also the, we should also think about uh, the uh, you know Japanese constitution, and always the case. Uh, so I think the uh, you know, fundamental questions are still there. We don't have uh, you know the we are not uh, you know the quite approach uh, to the situation of Germany, uh, like a tight and bender, uh, you know the change of the, of of, uh, of age, not in in that case. Uh, so uh, I think that it is uh, you know we need uh, still very careful consideration, but uh, the at least when Japan was attacked, we are ready to fight back, uh, you know, to some extent. And that is uh, something that uh, we have never, uh, you know, declared uh, in the past. So this is a declaratory uh, effect uh, against the possible uh, aggressor. Uh, so I think uh, that's uh, that's the situation. So, so, so please don't have uh, the, the Japan uh, has uh, totally alleviated uh, lift the any you know limits we have still, mm -hmm. and we are still uh, working together with the U U.S. and uh, so I think it is uh, it, it is quite uh, different uh, from uh, you know the uh, uh, the situation that you think uh, maybe. <laughs> so 
that's uh, something that I, I, can, I can answer to, to your specific question. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this precision. Okay. For sure, I was not implying uh, so much a change, uh, such a change. I was just uh, pointing out the fact that this new security strategy is evoking, you know, uh, more capabilities. And that was interesting to see how it could fit precisely with the yeah. situation you, you were just describing right now, which we have kept in mind, of course, uh, for sure. So thank you. Thank you for the precision. Valérie, you wanted to add uh, uh, something. Yes, uh, as uh, uh, first, maybe uh, among the participants, I see that we have uh, more than uh, 45 people uh, listening to that debate. So maybe if you want to ask any questions, uh, do not hesitate, because uh, even though uh, we are, uh, it's a little bit different first round table than we expected, still we can, uh, all of us, and, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Shinyo and Mr. Izobe for jumping in and uh, giving such uh, interesting um you know uh, very important uh, points and um, you you both will uh, make two presentations today so it's uh, thank you very much for that and for your uh, uh, effort i really appreciate and um just what both uh, i mean what we see here is exactly what the main issue in that region is that yeah um, nothing is straightforward i would say like a straightforward invasion of taiwan or invasion of japan or strike against japan from china or whatever but everything is gray hybrid and so japan particularly because of its constitution because of the education of the population because of the public opinion japan is extremely vulnerable to that kind of hybrid psychological warfare that China is so good at launching about, you know, the risk that Japan may take if it really, you know, go with the US and, and to try to defend Taiwan or whatever. I mean, and one of the issues, for instance, is that Japan is considering the possibility, as I said, in the new national strategy to, to to get some um, new missile, longer range missile by bases to strike foreign missile bases to prevent a missile strike against uh, Japan. It's very complicated. It's not that easy. But one of the first issue Japan will have is to get local governments and um, uh, organization or places to accept these new bases because immediately the fear is we will be a target we will become a target and there is a lot of opposition against that kind of you know uh situation so of course you can choose a place where there are you know small islands or whatever but still uh, this is an issue in japan it's not solved and on the government itself cannot decide, you know, just say it will be there and no discussion. I mean, it's not France or it's not as, you know, there is a degree of autonomy and public opinion is extremely strong against that kind of taking risk. The second main threat maybe is if China itself changes back to a more accommodating um, corporate, um, China is, the, the objective of China regarding Taiwan never changed. But there was a time when China was less aggressive than it is now under Xi Jinping, where it was much more uh, positively perceived in Taiwan also, uh, business circles doing business with China, and quite a few with the KMT, uh, not all of the KMT, but part of the KMT, where, you know, why not one China? You know, it's just a principle, you know, and we are doing business and there is an interdependency. So it was much easier for China to convince Taiwan, for instance, that uh, reunification, it's not really reunification, it's one country, two systems. And of course, Xi Jinping destroyed all this with what happened in Hong Kong and is very aggressive. Uh, positioning. But what about, what of Xi Jinping? He is facing huge difficulties, as, as I said, and I'm not sure that his power is as strong now inside the CCP as 
people thought it was uh, at the 20, uh, 20th uh, Congress of the, of the CCP. I'm sure that, you know, we see some small moves and of course there are a lot of military things and so on, but um, maybe some inside the CCP would like to go back to a strategy, much more amenable strategy uh, from China, much more less aggressive, and in a way, less, uh, much more advantageous for uh, China's own interest, like convincing Taiwan that China is not a threat, convincing Japan that China is not a threat, uh, building back better relationship with the US and go back to transfer of technology. You know, these things could change. And it doesn't mean that China changes its objective. It's just that it's more intelligent in achieving these objectives. So it will not be less dangerous. It will be maybe more dangerous uh, and less obvious than it is today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we will, we will close this in a few minutes. But before that, I have two lines of questions here. Uh, one line related to the... Uh, Taiwan issues, and I will uh, ask maybe you, Valérie, and maybe our um, um, uh, two uh, participants here, and thank you again for jumping in. Um, um, there's a question about the, the, uh, the building up of military Iceland in the area. Uh, the US and Japan are planning exercises in the new built up Japanese desert island. Do you see something like a, 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 some sort of a building up process uh, uh, of military uh, uh, islands in this area and and uh, there's also a question about what would be uh, well the, the weakest capability in japan regarding china today what would be the the uh, would be the effort to do that that's very much on the uh, defensive military uh, um, thinking here but i have another question maybe uh, that will also interest you which is uh, um, also the relationship is what with the dynamics we see in europe uh, um, in Europe, uh, German uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz has argued that a block structure, authoritarian versus democratic, is not inevitable and should be avoided. And in parallel, Japan has pointed uh, to closer cooperation of China and Russia in military exercises. Does it mean that China is seeing a new block structure as inevitable, which would be a different way of approaching this? So I, I, I I give you this uh, these questions. Once about the, do you see a build up uh, in the in in the, in the Japanese uh, desert islands, some some somewhere a military build up, and especially in U.S. and Japan are planning exercises in in in, in this area. And also, do you see a maybe a different view of Japan regarding this black structure, you know, that is might be inevitable in in the area. So I don't know if uh, if uh, Valerie, you want to just start a uh, small question, and maybe Isobe San will be first. Okay, please. Okay. I think Mr. Isobe will answer that question. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the question is that uh, the, the desert island is a very small, tiny island on, on the, near the southwestern islands. Yeah. And it and I, I think it's called the name is uh, Magejima. And uh, this will be uh, built as an, uh, a hub of the exercise and also the uh, supply. And uh, now we will be uh, uh, constructed and the night uh, touch and go or landing exercise by the jet fighters will be uh, conducted soon. So, Actually, in southwestern islands, we have very limited uh, military exercise facilities. So we need this kind of facilities, and we'd like to conduct uh, exercise with the United States and also like-minded countries to show our will uh, to the neighboring countries. And the next, and the another question is uh, uh, Chinese. Uh, uh, maneuver, maybe Chinese uh, strategy. The most uh, difficult one to cope with is that uh, China tried to convince Japanese people uh, that uh, China is not an, uh, uh, China is a peaceful country. But actually, the attitude the Xi Jinping's uh, regime 
they are going another way because of the stop the visas uh, to, to Japanese uh, uh, businessmen or tourists. So I think uh, in Japan, the most of the people uh, don't believe the Chinese uh, political leadership right now. This is my uh, opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have the floor. Please, your mic is off. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I think there has been, uh, you know, the uh, uh, one uh, question from uh, the audience that uh, what is the weak point of Japan? Yes. And um, I would like to say that the weak point of Japan is that well, the first one is that Japan is not a member of a permanent member of the Security Council. So Japan is not able to, you know, take part in the decision making, great decision making, whatever. When the, you know, China, uh, you know, invade Taiwan, for example, I think there will be, of course, a discussion on what to do in the Security Council, but Japan is not uh, always there. So I think this is the very weak point and minor point. And um, uh, number two is uh, that Japan is not so much well prepared for the propaganda uh, war, the uh, propaganda or law war or psychological war and so on and so forth. So I think those kind of things uh, have not been so much, uh, you know, trained. And uh, so I think it is not the, uh, you know, the centerpiece of the uh, Japanese strategy, uh, but uh, we should improve the situation, but, uh, you know, we should be prepared for the propaganda or, you know, the uh, uh, misinformation uh, or fake information or whatever. You know, I think this is the vulnerability. Uh, and uh, I think the Mr. Pasco, you uh, 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 asked uh, whether, you know, the juxtaposition, uh, you know, the confrontation between the two, uh, the democracy or non-democracy. Well, I think uh, this, uh, uh, maybe I think uh, if we, we don't do anything, this could be perhaps, uh, you know, the deepened. And um, because uh, the reason why is that the Chinese uh, will be so much, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, have the Eurasianism uh, together with the, uh, not only Russia, but also the, uh, you know, Iran and also the, uh, you know, Pakistan and, uh, or even India uh, and uh, some countries. I think uh, this is the, you know, Chinese strategy. And this is, of course, the anti-Americanism, uh, centering around the anti-Americanism. And, uh, but we should not, uh, you know, uh, let those, uh, you know, the juxtapositions of the two uh, continue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think uh, what we we have to do uh, as Japan and uh, you know other uh, you know the uh, uh, mid middle power countries uh, have to do is to uh, uh, well uh, the uh, uh, do something against this and then perhaps uh, to hold uh, some uh, international conference uh, in 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 uh, Asia Pacific uh, or Indo Pacific, inviting every uh, you know the uh, uh, heads of government like the uh, CSC or OSC, the Sinki process was the case. I think it is now the time uh, for Japan and other countries to do this. And then, uh, you know, to, uh, 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 you know, defend or to uh, prohibit or prevent those kind of things to, to, take, uh, to, to take place. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think this is something that we have to do. Otherwise, I think, uh, as you rightly said, the, it will be going, you know, A or B or A and B juxtaposition of the two different type yeah. that kind of things will not be the case thank you thank you very much for this uh, very clear <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. of course very interesting um, uh, uh, statement um, um Valerie, you just wanted to jump in a bit because we have a last question and that might be the last one because i think we need to close now but no i think uh, for me it's okay and yeah. uh, maybe we will uh, unless there is one last question there is but... one la one very last one and maybe uh, maybe for you valerie maybe but, uh, also for our, our colleagues um what is the impact of the disagreement of france japan taiwan and china with the legal arguments developed in the arbitration award of 12 july 2016 island rock with the problem of, around taiwan you know this arbitration how, how do you see the Relationship. Well, uh, well uh, I will not elaborate because uh, it's a very important issue, of course, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, Japan who do not who does not recognize they do not recognize the validity of that uh, the, 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 the decision as the arbitral uh, arbitration. Um, but it has been uh, extremely important to demonstrate that uh, 
China re re revendication, territorial revendication on the will of China to change the status quo by force, uh, be it in the South China Sea against the Philippines, this is what was the arbitration was about, uh, or even uh, Taiwan, because one of these islands in uh, the South China Sea is uh, controlled, I mean, belongs uh, in a way to, to the Republic of China, Taiwan. Uh, so this is extremely important to show that uh, China was very much isolated by the international community on this issue, mm -hmm. but of course, China does not recognize the uh, decision. So um, mm -hmm. this is an ongoing thing, and it uh, it's, uh, I mean, South China Sea, Taiwan Strait, East China Sea is a part of uh, where China is trying to increase its influence, uh, but with, as we saw, uh, still limited military capability, ex particularly if the US are strongly engaged still, not only the US, of course, but right. strongly engaged uh, in the region in terms of principles and in terms of capability and involvement. And this is one of the main issues, I think, that China will try to attack and weaken. So okay. to divide uh, between allies. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valérie. And, and thank you for our two uh, participants. And, uh, and thank you really for your very uh, uh, interesting insights. Um, by the way, it's interesting because we have been uh, exploring much beyond the only Taiwan Straits issues. And you, we have set the stage already. And we go now to the security of global commons. So I give you the, I hand over to you, uh, uh, Valérie. And, uh, you have the floor for the second round table. And thank you. And so I, I, I recall everybody that you can use the Q&A, uh, of course, uh, uh, section. And even raise your hand if you, if you I guess, uh, really wants to. OK, Valérie. Thank you, uh, Xavier. And saying thank you to uh, both our uh, Japanese participants for jumping in. Um, so now we are uh, going uh, to our second round table of that uh, web conference for one hour again. And same uh, principle. You, we will. There will be two uh, presentations, about fifteen minutes or a little bit more if you want, and followed by Q and A or debate between ourselves. Uh, the first, uh, you already know, um, um, speaker will be uh, uh, Professor uh, Takahiro Shinio, who is dean and professor at Kwansei uh, Gakuin University, and I will let you read uh, his bio uh, that you received in the invitation. And and uh, we will have also, and I'm very glad to have her and she accepted to participate, um, Professor Eva Pishova. Uh, she is still an uh, associate fellow at FRS, but a more important position now and um, a very exciting one is the head of Japan chair at the Free University in Brussels. And uh, so I'm again very glad to have her, to have both of you speaking in, on this round table about um, another very important important issue expanding from uh, Asia Pacific and the Taiwan Strait to the security of global commons and the role of Europe. Uh, a vision from Japan, what we can do, what Japan does in this field, and of course, uh, from uh, Europe with uh, Eva Peshova. So, uh, uh, Professor uh, Takashiro Shinyo, I give you first the floor for that uh, second uh, round table. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Ki. And uh, uh, could I use uh, my PowerPoint uh, so that could I share my? Yes, of course, please PowerPoint. do. Okay. Uh huh. So this is my PowerPoint, and uh, you know uh, I would like to talk about the uh, you know the uh, reform of the Security Council, uh, because I think the when you talk about the global commons, uh, United Nations is nothing but a glo global commons, and uh, but this uh, you know the global commons or global public goods. Uh, is not functioning well or greatly damaged. And uh, so I think uh, we should uh, perhaps mend uh, the uh, this uh, public, uh, you know, the uh, commons or uh, public goods. Uh, the uh, particularly, I think the, uh, you know, uh, the Security Council is a problem. Uh, the other functions of the United Nations is functioning. Uh, look at the, uh, you know, the uh, secu uh, ECOSOC or look at the, you know, the other uh, General Assembly uh, or other in, in, in United Nations organizations, uh, funds and programs. So they are working very hard. And uh, I think there is no such a great, you know, the uh, issues, um, but only the Security Council has been 
uh, always malfunctioning. It is not always, always uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, it has been, uh, you know, not uh, simply uh, this time, but uh, in, in, during the uh, in the Cold War, I think uh, Security Council didn't work very well, just because of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, vetoes uh, or lack of uh, cooperation and uh, or very much, uh, you know, the uh, obsessed with the national interest. And that is uh, exactly uh, the thing that uh, should be improved. Uh, and we try to improve uh, uh, or reform the Security Council uh, since a long time. And as far as I know, when I was, uh, you know, member of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I, I was also fully involved in this issue. And uh, it was 1994 uh, when the uh, General Assembly started, uh, you know, the uh, uh, well uh, discussions on this issue. Uh, but uh, since then, uh, uh, close to uh, 30 years have passed. Nothing happened. No inch of move was the case. Uh, so, so totally, so, totally disappointed on the side of the uh, non-members of the Security Council. Uh, and uh, you know, there has been negotiations uh, since uh, 2009. Negotiations. What does it mean? It is not uh, negotiations at all. Uh, although it was called negotiation, it was only blah 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 talking and uh, you know the uh, talk shop uh, since uh, 2009. So that uh, you know uh, the um, Ukrainian war and also the uh, invasion by Russia and this kind of the uh, the, the blatant act of aggression uh, opened uh, the eyes uh, of our, of us uh, once again. And then uh, I think uh, most of the countries uh, you know feel that it's necessary to. Uh, uh, once again, engage in in this uh, problematic. Uh, well, this is the history, and uh, a basic recognition I would like to uh, share with you. This is my basic recognition, uh, as I see from the international situation. The international community uh, must uh, prepare for the next crisis. Uh, you know, the after Ukraine, uh, maybe I think uh, you know uh, the other crisis uh, will be emerging, and we should be very much prepared for it. We don't have any time to lose, so that we should not, uh, you know, they spent much time on the Security Council reform. Uh, so 30 years, no, never. Uh, we should, uh, you know, be uh, uh, very uh, quickly uh, and uh, fixed uh, this this issue. So the time is uh, very much limited. Uh, number three, uh, I think the uh, many countries thought that uh, the uh, because of the uh, you know the grain in war and uh, because of the uh, Russia. Uh, we don't want to increase the privileged member of the uh, Security Council. So no more increase of the permanent members, which have a veto. Number four, Japan and Europe must work very hard on veto reform. The United States President, uh, Mr. Biden, uh, you know, uh, said, even, even he said that uh, the veto must be reformed. We should not use uh, the veto, uh, you know, the, uh, so often. Uh, and uh, France and the UK, uh, have never used veto since 1990, more than 30 years. That should be the case. Uh, uh, and number five is the uh, plan to expand the permanent membership of the council is uh, uh, regrettably bound to fail uh, because uh, you know they need two third majority, but two third majority is 129 countries out of 193 countries. 129 is a huge uh, member uh, number. Uh, and I, I don't think it is it would be uh, possible for 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 uh, security council reform to to get support. You know, when you increase permanent member, uh, and uh, well, Japan. When I look at the Japan, I think the uh, you know the its economy is uh, you know becoming smaller, and uh, will become uh, perhaps uh, you know the middle power, a strong and a big middle power, but. Uh, so uh, what I uh, think is necessary is to to enhance the role of the uh, not the big uh, superpower, the role of middle powers. That should be you know the uh, strengthened, and that should be uh, the core of the reform. Uh, well, we have a lot of the uh, you know strong and viable uh, mid uh, uh, you know middle power countries. We must carry out really a feasible reforms. And uh, so in that sense, I think we need a two steps reform. Uh, well, if uh, the uh, reform is uh, will not be done, uh, I think the uh, Security Council will lost its totally a credibility entirely. And so that we should, uh, you know, the uh, uh, rely on the uh, using of the uh, uh, emergency special session of the General Assembly more and more. 
what was the uh, what were the uh, you know stunts uh, uh, of the uh, heads of government uh, at the uh, Security Council uh, uh, general debate of the Security Council uh, general debate of the United Nations last year 2022. Uh, Ukraine said uh, Russia must you know be removed and Russia veto uh, should be uh, uh, deprived of should 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 be stopped. And Japan is, uh, you know, the uh, saying that uh, the text-based negotiation should start. You know, we need a text-based ne negotiation. The United States, uh, Mr. Biden said that uh, the uh, they are in favor of the, uh, you know, increase of the even the found member of the Security Council, inclu including uh, Japan and uh, some other countries, uh, and also the Africa Central uh, uh, and South America or Caribbean. So there was a, you know, very positive lip service. France, France welcomes new permanent members of the Security Council, restricting the veto power of uh, countries that committed mass atrocities. So the France is very positive uh, in terms of the, you know, the uh, reform of veto. Uh, and uh, Turkey said it is very interesting. The uh, president Erdogan uh, is a view. The world is bigger than the five countries. So the United Nations must be reformed. Yeah. And uh, Turkey is very much uh, uh, proactive, and uh, uh, I think the uh, you know the uh, there will be uh, perhaps a new uh, uh, idea or proposal coming from Turkey uh, in the next uh, days, next years to come. Russia supports uh, the uh, you know the uh, permanent members of the uh, uh, from Africa, uh, Asia, Central uh, and South America. Uh, and in India and Brazil is okay, but Japan, Germany is not okay. <laughs> That was uh, very clear because uh, those two countries are the, the enemy countries. Well, uh, that is the uh, position. And uh, what must be the reform? Uh, well, I skip this. Uh, I come to the immediately uh, to the uh, you know uh, important one. Uh, well, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, uh, was uh, you know in favor of India and Brazil. And um, uh, Turkey, uh, as I said before, is uh, uh, would try to step forward so that uh, Turkey's idea is to include uh, 20 G20, you know, as uh, you know, permanent members of the Security Council in the future, in a long, long future. And uh, well, uh, the, uh, and China uh, hasn't said, uh, you know, clearly about the the uh, his uh, stance. But uh, surely China is not so much happy about the, uh, you know, the uh, having Japan as a permanent member of the Security Council, and uh, the uh, there are uh, consensus groups, uh, you know, South Africa, uh, South Korea, and Pakistan, and Mexico, which uh, uh, wants only the expansion of the uh, non-permanent members. Yeah. So, uh, in that uh, 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 circumstances, I think uh, Japan should. Um, uh, well, uh, aim at uh, the uh, uh, different uh, strategy, and uh, we should not, uh, uh, as, uh, as far as I am concerned, and uh, it's my view, uh, Japan should not expand uh, the uh, permanent member of the Security Council. Japan should change its strategy for becoming permanent member of the Security Council, you know, because it uh, takes long time and it will never come. And so that uh, we should uh, promote uh, the idea of semi permanent members, semi-permanent seats. And, uh, you know, the uh, we should have uh, six to eight seats, uh, which have uh, perhaps uh, longer terms than the uh, non-permanent members, maybe four to eight years, and then re-electable, you know, direct after the uh, expiration of the uh, terms. Uh, and uh, with this and semi-permanent members, it can be a joint seat of two or three countries, maybe two. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think uh, if that is the case, if this, uh, you know, the idea uh, would be uh, 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 tabled, uh, this is my hope that uh, the uh, the two third majority could be could <coughs> be get if the uh, diplomacy is working very, uh, you know, effectively. Uh, but we need uh, the uh, two step uh, Security Council reform. The first one is the very short, uh, you know, the uh, uh, short term uh, Security Council uh, reform. And that is the, uh, you know, the uh, establishment of the uh, or introduction of the semi-permanent members, you know. And the uh, uh, longer one 
Uh, as a second step is the uh, more comprehensive, and that is the uh, you know the totally uh, reforming uh, the permanent member of the Security Council uh, in 2045, the hundredth anniversary of the uh, United Nations. I don't know whether United Nations can survive until that period of time, but anyway, we need we need the uh, you know the uh, a first step, and this first step is uh, as far as I I know uh, might be possible. OK, and uh, I uh, would like to touch upon the uh, role of Europe. Uh, well, I think the uh, role of Europe uh, is very clear. How to treat Russia in the Security Council as permanent five? What would you do? Uh, Mr. Zelensky said, you know, kick out Russia. If you, uh, you, if you don't, uh, you know, the, solve the question of the invasion, what for? What is the purpose of it? What for are you? <laughs> You know, in the Security Council. So I think uh, this question must be asked, answered by the the uh, you know par, uh, P5, permanent fives, including France, uh, UK, America. You know, and so that uh, you should try to find the answer to this. But we haven't heard any answer to this, and uh, uh, so I really don't know why uh, the uh, those countries uh, P5 are so silent on this issue. You know. Uh, because they have the uh, same fate, maybe, uh, sharing the fate. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and uh, number two is the responsibility of the US and UK to recall the agreement of Yalta. Uh, what was agreed upon Yalta, you know, 1945. This is very important co conference because I think the, uh, you know, the veto issue was discussed. And there was an agreement and the, uh, there was a provision in the uh, Charter of the United Nations. Uh, Article uh, 47 or so, 27 or 47, or just, uh, and uh, so that uh, the uh, there is a restrictions uh, when uh, the permanent members of the uh, you know Security Council is is a party to the conflict, they should abstain from the voting uh, when it comes to the uh, you know peaceful solution of the problem, uh, but uh, never uh, this has been the case. So you have to recall, we have to recall the agreement of Yalta. But China, uh, in those days, it was a different China. So they don't know. Russia, uh, Russia is, uh, you know, the Soviet Union uh, was a case, but Russia, it is successor. And they don't know exactly what uh, was really agreed upon in Yalta. We should recall this. Uh, number three, are, Fra are France and UK mm -hmm. willing to uh, take uh, the stronger initiative to reform the Security Council and its veto? I hope that will be the case. And France is in a better position and a, a good position to lead this. And I do hope that France uh, will lead, take lead more re, uh, leadership. And uh, what is about the responsibility of the West to tame uh, Russia? I think the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it is a responsibility of the, uh, you know, the NATO, uh, United States uh, and the whole NATO countries to tame, to treat, you know, this, uh, how to, how to uh, deal with the uh, Russia, to tame. It's your responsibility. We are doing together, but indirectly. Yeah, uh, we share the uh, common purpose. But the main actors are Europeans uh, and Americans. Can Europe, particularly Germany and France, stop appeasing Russia and China? I think it is. Uh, we we see uh, so many appeasing, you know, uh, from uh, Germany and uh, France. Uh, and um, I think uh, that was uh, one of the reasons why, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, Russia uh, thought that, uh, you know, no reaction would be coming if, even if uh, they invade Ukraine. So there were peace to peace in order to get the, uh, you know, the energy and so on and so forth. So that now is the time to stop appeasing Russia and China. Uh, and uh, how to restore the regional security cooperation framework, like, uh, you know, CSC Helsinki agreement, or final act or OSCE that was breached by Russia. And what uh, would you like to do? Because this is the signed agreement, legally binding. But Russia, you know, breached the OSCE Helsinki final act and also OSCE was uh, ignored. So how to restore this? This is also the responsibility and role of Europe. Uh, what role uh, United Nations can play to realize a ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine, uh, who is going to, uh, you know, the uh, well go between uh, Russia and Ukraine? United States, 
Uh, it's pretty difficult. Uh, Europe, uh, I don't know. Turkey, India, China. Uh, well, I think uh, there should be uh, you know the role to be played by uh, some of the uh, you know uh, responsible members of the UN. Uh, well, of course, Japan is also included in this. And uh, if time comes, uh, I, uh, I'm of the view that Japan should also play an important role. Uh, but I think more role to be played by the responsible members of the UN, uh, you know, Europeans, Americans, or Indians. I don't know. And um, is Europe ready to uh, protect Ukraine uh, after the uh, ceasefire agreement is, uh, you know, the uh, sign? Or are you ready to uh, send peacekeeping operations or preventive uh, deployment of the peacekeeping for the prevention? Uh, I think uh, uh, we should be ready. And I think uh, in, in this case, uh, Japan could also, you know, must also think about, uh, you know, uh, to participate in that uh, preventive uh, deployment of the peacekeeping. Okay, and uh, my last uh, point is the uh, the future of uh, you know the status of Ukraine in Europe, neutrality, or UN presence there, or NATO NATO member. Well, I think it is uh, very difficult. Uh, we I don't we don't have any any clear cut answer, uh, but uh, something must must be done. Neutrality, like uh, the type of the Austria, uh, Austria is a member of the EU, uh, but not member of the NATO. Uh, and uh, Austria's uh, neutrality it was guaranteed by, uh, you know, tr by treaty. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I really don't know. Uh, so I think uh, this uh, must be discussed uh, uh, within the context context of the uh, you know international politics and and the UN. Okay, I should uh, stop here, and I'm ready to uh, you know ask uh, answer any questions uh, which you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, Professor. And uh, now I will, uh, I have many remarks and questions indeed, but I will first give the floor to Eva Peshova and then uh, please do not hesitate to, 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 to raise your hand or put your question in by, with the Q&A button. And uh, so we can, um, uh, I can relay them after the presentation by uh, Eva Peshova. Eva Peshova, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Valérie. It's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this, uh, of this conference. I think this topic is here uh, with us to stay for the next couple of years, at least, uh, unfortunately. So in my presentation, I actually decided to take the title of this conference and of this panel uh, rather literally and ask myself a key question, which is how does the dual China-Russia challenge impact the security and the governance of global commons? And by doing so, I will look very briefly on, on four examples of the deep seas management or governance, Arctic, outer space and cyberspace. And of course, a disclaimer here, for the sake of time, I will not go too much in depth into, into those domains because they're all hugely important and complex, but it is really to demonstrate the sort of norm revisionism that China and Russia are coordinating to, to put in place. And the key is really to demonstrate a kind of a main proposition that I'm trying to put here is that we're witnessing a new form of strategic competition that leads to a polarization uh, of the normative landscape. Uh, and basically, not just uh, uh, seeing an emer the risk is to see an emergence of not just the competitive uh, governance system, but a parallel one. Uh, and bear with me as I, as I go there. Uh, first of all, I think that the China-Russia rapprochement now that we're seeing in the context of Ukraine is really just the tip of an iceberg. Yeah. It is something that is much more, uh, that is going much more deep uh, and is much more broad ranging than we thought. Uh, of course, the, the shared threat perception, the kind of anti-Western sentiments and the revision of the rules-based order is, is, is of course at the core of these two uh, actors approaches and it's something that is not new. It's also much more long lasting than we thought. Uh, scientific cooperation, coordination within the UN different bodies and working groups has been here for many years and largely underestimated. Economic, politi political and security cooperation is, is on the rise. But it's also the very broad geographical reach that we seem to have underestimated for a very long time. Uh, if we look just at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, with the accession of India and Pakistan in 2017, the SCO actually counts uh, half of the global population. Uh, 
Now we add the BRICS formation. We add the Chinese influence through the Belt and Road Initiative. All this leads to a pretty much tacit, sometimes more or less tacit support and sympathy of many countries of the global south. So I'm actually glad that we were talking about the UN system, but numbers are actually quite important. We are here in, in a, and whether we like it or not, much more polarized world. And uh, without wanting to paint it in, a, in a, the whole authoritarian versus democratic uh, binary, when it comes to the governance of global commons, the two paradigms here are openness versus enclosure, right? Um, and whether we like it or not, as I said, we are heading towards a parallel uh, approach uh, or system of governance of these commons. So to illustrate my point, um, let us look at the deep seas. So we all know that the deep seas uh, are home to the critical undersea infrastructure, the submarine cables that carry 90% of our data flows, the data are the future and will become, of course, much more important um, as we head towards a more digitalized uh, global economy. They are also home to a critical minerals, uh, rare earth elements, uh, precious ores, you know, gold, uh, cobalt, zinc, uh, you name it, that are crucially needed for a green transition, the trend that we're all seeking to, to pursue. So the economic importance of, of these uh, undersea uh, minerals uh, is extremely important. And we are uh, seeing in many countries a shift, uh, a, a more strategic orientation of focus on, uh, on the exploitation protection of deep sea maritime interests. Just in France last year, France has published its uh, deep sea strategy. Many other countries are looking uh, towards that. And of course, China uh, for its you know, technological and um, I would say superiority when it comes to this uh, is, is in the forefront of, of this race to the bottom. The legal implications are huge because we're talking about the area uh, under UNCLOS, which is uh, uh, normally supposed to be the, uh, the common heritage of mankind. It is not supposed to be exploited, at least not for commercial uh, purposes. Uh, so we are literally opening a Pandora's box uh, from a legal point of view. And I'm not even talking about the environmental impacts, which is, of course, another completely uh, separate debate. Uh, but just to say that China has been leading uh, and has been very actively pushing the International Seabed Authority to release and reform its uh, way of granting access to, uh, to those undersea resources. And this is a really a topic that we will um, see much more in the, in the future. My other example is the Arctic. And again, we, we're talking, we're, we're seeing a growing rapprochement between China and Russia in the Arctic since 2014, since the isolation, progressive isolation of Russia in the context of uh, the Crimea uh, invasion, uh, which is uh, going forward. Of course, China is a, is a prime, uh, has prime interests in, in, uh, in the Arctic, not only because of the Northern Sea Route, but of course, also on the immense energy resources that, uh, that are laying mostly within the, uh, the Russian territory. Uh, what is interesting now in the context of Ukraine is uh, that uh, with the accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO, the Arctic Council uh, is, is mostly composed actually of NATO members with the exception of Russia. Now, a, a minor thing here that, that may be, uh, again, uh, of, of much greater importance is that it somehow, of course, politicizes uh, the Arctic Council, or at least uh, that's the perspective of China and Russia, um, and, and somehow undermines its legitimacy. So we already see uh, efforts or criticisms uh, by, uh, by China and Russia uh, of the Arctic Council and saying that, you know, basically there is a tendency to ignore uh, in the future any sort of regulations that have been put in place and go ahead with their own, uh, with their own plans. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching the surface here. In space, uh, you would probably come across a lot of articles talking about the increasing uh, cooperation between China and Russia. This was mostly visible in their announcement to integrate their satellite uh, monitoring systems, the Beidou and the GLONASS. Uh, there, we've been hearing about uh, plans to develop a joint lunar base, uh, 
of course, also lunar mining. I mean, this is, uh, this is not science fiction anymore, but this is the sort of next frontiers that China is very actively looking at already. Uh, and in, in, in reality, uh, I mean, of course, there is an economic dimension because the integrating, uh, China already has ground monitoring stations in Argentina, Iran, Thailand, and builds more as part of his Belt and Road Initiative. Russia has its own in South Africa, Angola, uh, a lot of African countries. So together, there is a real uh, push to, to compete against the US GPS system. So there's an economic impact, but there is, of course, a very great military uh, impact as well, because as we know, uh, China is, is uh, very actively looking at space-related electronic warfare, um, the capacity to, to jam eventually intercept communications and radar systems and the GPS navigation is, is of course increased with this, with this China-Russia um, cooperation. Again, uh, we can polemize about Russia's uh, still underdeveloped, the lack of resources to invest into space technologies, but nonetheless, uh, this trend is, is there. And finally, another very quick example is, uh, is cyberspace, the control of information space. Now, of course, we know that open internet is a threat uh, to domestic stability and regime, leg leg regime legitimacy of authoritarian uh, states such as China and Russia. Both have been uh, putting in place uh, technical and legal ways to, to strengthen uh, control of uh, online activities, including censorship, localization of data, survey of people, and criminalization of online activities. But both have been very much coordinating also uh, to push this um, internationally. So uh, again, following up with what has been said in a, in a previous uh, presentation, uh, the SCO founding members in 2015 actually put in place the International Code of Conduct for Information Security to the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts on Advancing Responsible State Behavior in Cyberspace, the UNGGE. Now, to my knowledge, and I'm not a cybersecurity expert myself, um, I understand that basically since 2015, the UNGGE has been meeting regularly. And because of this coordination within, let's say, SCO, but China, Russia mainly, we are uh, in a stalemate, right? So again, another example of how, uh, while we may talk about the norm revisionism, it, we're basically shifting away from not one rules-based order, but an emerging of a parallel one, uh, which some or whoever wants uh, may, uh, may access to. <clears throat> now, to uh, what's the role of Europe? Um, I agree with, uh, with my previous speaker on, on, on uh, most of the points. But I think when it comes to global commons, there is, um, uh, there is also the regulatory power uh, that, it, and that it can uh, exert. Uh, all these domains, uh, and that's what's interesting in, in the global commons debate in general, are not yet fully governed, not yet fully codified under international law. And I think it's precisely these domains that we need to be proactive in and try to uh, suggest a, a more robust regulatory system. And there is legitimacy for Europe in that sense uh, as, a, as a trading power uh, for its economic weight, as a, as a regulatory power. We always refer to, to Europe as being this, uh, this laboratory of multilateral regulatory practices, which is true and it's one of the things that we do quite well. Uh, and all these domains are cutting across uh, several important ones. So it's not just about security, it touches about trade, it touches on connectivity, on communications, critical communication infrastructure. It touches on digitalization. So the, the, the economic weight and the kind of legal expertise really comes in hand. And of course, in many cases, it's also about environmental regulations in which uh, the EU does, does pretty well. The other good news in that sense, and I'm always optimistic in trying to uh, you know, find solution, is that by cutting across all these domains and by talking about global commons, we are actually um, getting into the, the, the vif du sujet. We're getting into um, the, the, the core working um, bulk uh, of um, uh, our partnerships with like-minded partners, including Japan. 
right? So we have the EU uh, connectivity, EU Japan connectivity, digitalization, green transition partnerships, through which we can actually together influence the formulation of, of the regulation of these of these common spaces. Uh, there are, I mean, I would, uh, you know, I can I can quote at least the last. Uh, what was it? The um, the EU's critical infrastructure regulation, which was published in uh, October last year, uh, which actually openly uh, proposes um, um, well, a concrete action plan for preparedness, uh, enhanced response capacity within the EU on the protection of critical uh, critical infrastructure. And here we're talking uh, uh, energy, digital transport and space. So it includes the undersea cables, for instance, etc., and uh, which pushes, of course, for greater cooperation with NATO and, uh, and outside on the protection of this. I mean, this is something that could be taken as an example. Um, but of course, uh, we will see probably more uh, in the different strategies that are uh, to come, including the maritime security strategy. And we will see the, the update now coming in, in, in March um, and, and within, of course, uh, the, the UN. I could probably stop here if that's okay, and and uh, and I'm happy to, of course, get into any of the questions. Uh, but this was really just to give you a bit of an overview of the big picture of strategic contestations in global commons and the role of China and Russia. Thank you, Eva, for this um, excellent um, presentation. And um, I invite again all the participants to use the Q&R button to try if you want to ask or make a comment or ask questions, and I will relay that. And please don't do it during the last three minutes of this hour, <laughs> because it makes it much more difficult to, to try to, to, to build a debate, because these, con these conferences, even though they are on Zoom, uh, are supposed to be a kind of dialogue, what we did a little bit impromptu, impromptu in the first uh, round table <laughs> between participants, of course, and you can all jump in, but also with uh, the more than 45 people who are just listening to that uh, web conference. And um, it and I also, this, this exchange is so how needed they are. Because um, even between uh, like-minded countries like Japan and uh, European countries or France or whatever, because there are some misperceptions still uh, going on there. And uh, misperceptions that can be also used. And we, we, we are speaking about info, information, <clears throat> sorry, misinfo, disinformation, um, fake news, propaganda, all these things. And I just would like to, um, to go back to, it's a very small, narrow point of uh, Professor uh, Takashiro Hinio presentation about when will uh, Germany and France will stop appeasing Russia and China. And this is something, I don't know if, if you will agree with me, we both share the uh, same interest in Japan and we have a lot of colleagues in Japan. And this is something I hear very often when I am in Japan discussing with uh, partners um, about, uh, you know, how in Europe, Europe first, there is also this vision that Europe cannot do a lot in terms of military or whatever, and should stick to its own specificity, and more of it should stick to being supportive of US mainly, and let the US do the job in uh, Asia Pacific or even Indo Pacific. And there is some suspicion when uh, Europe or France is speaking of strategic autonomy or whatever, that it's a way to uh, separate oneself from the US, uh, the main actor in terms of security. And I completely agree with that. But I think it's a little bit, things are a little bit more complex than that. And coming back to appeasing Germany, uh, Germany and France are appeasing uh, Russia and China. First, maybe the two situations are a little bit different, uh, especially for Germany regarding Russia. We mm -hmm. all know the huge energy issues Europe is facing, Germany has been facing. And, uh, you know, all this uh, cooperation they had uh, in terms of gas uh, with the Nord Stream and so on with Germany. 
But looking at Japan, for instance, uh, Japan itself is facing the same kind of issues. Um, Japan itself uh, is still uh, thinking that it cannot get rid of its own Sakhalin 2 pipeline still going on with Russia and having ongoing discussions with Russia concerning uh, energy. Uh, it's it's not so much. It's about nine percent of uh, Japan LNG coming from the Sakhalin two, but specifically the Japanese government asked uh, Japanese company, despite of the sanctions or whatever, to go on uh, using Sakhalin two and to not to disturb more than it is today energy con uh, energy approvisionment, I lost the word, of, of Japan. So if this is a big issue for Japan, it was a big issue and still a big issue for Europe and Germany. But I think in that sense, Japan can understand the dilemma uh, some countries then might feel in terms of interdependencies. And I completely agree that uh, Europe, like other part of the world, including US and uh, Japan, or, and uh, should work towards being more independent towards uh, regard vis-a-vis -vis these countries, Russia and Japan. They use their power in a way uh, to, to put pressure on influence. But I think this is an issue that we share, that we must discuss and maybe not focus too much on who is appeasing, appeasing what country because that game can be played uh, both ways in a way. <laughs> in a, and, um, and China, again, China and Russia are also trying to, to, to play on these divisions, you know, trying to, 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 to use this in order to increase their influences on Japan, on Europe, and Germany, France, and so on. So this is a point that has to be kept in mind. And this is why I think dialogue on exchanges, ongoing exchanges is very important, especially because, uh, again, in Japan, some do not realize that especially regarding China, the position of France, but also of Europe has completely changed uh, in the last five, 10 years regarding China. And uh, the France and Europe are less and less in an appeasing position regarding China than it used to be. And it has to be integrated into the strategic thinking of countries far away from Europe, uh, and I understand that for uh, Japan, uh, China is a huge issue. Uh, but um, again, dialogue is absolutely necessary to, to correct maybe a little bit the image we might have of each other's involvement, interdependencies, issues. Uh, and I don't know, Eva, if you want to add something on this, but I think this is an issue that we really need to, to tackle. Uh, I, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I wanted just a second on that and complete uh, a little bit because uh, I was also struck by the appeasing word. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you picked it up um, because from the European perspective, it is about defending its own interests, right? So that that's the common line. It is not. Uh, it is not about appeasing. It is about promoting its interests and of course the economic dependency and the the willingness to include China or engage uh, or not to completely dis. Uh, you know. Uh, disregard China in, in global politics has been there for forever. And to my knowledge, actually, it is quite shared also with our Japanese colleagues. Exactly. Uh, so uh, in, in a way uh, that it, we are much closer uh, to the to the Japanese perspective than uh, the US. And I'm wondering, of course, the transatlantic coordination is ongoing. Uh, and there's progress within the Trade and Technology Council. Uh, there are regular consultations. Um, but uh, I think that there is also an interest of everyone to differentiate a little bit between the European and the US approach for the because it is not just China, but it is also the dynamic steered by the US China competition itself that is nefast that is that is having a negative impact on, on global economy and, 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 and stability as well. So when we're talking about, uh, you know, some sort of division labor, uh, this is something that has been going on for forever of, uh, you know, Europe taking care uh, of its own security and leave uh, 
uh, the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific to, to the US. But there has been quite a few analyses uh, lately uh, trying to simulate. Of course, Europe doesn't even have uh, the military capacities to take care of its own uh, of its own neighborhood right now. So a complete uh, you know, disengagement, theoretical disengagement of the US from the European theater could be uh, actually um, harmful in the long run, because of course, an, a, 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 a break, a, an écroulement of, of the European security would be much more costly for the US in the long term, if it happens, and if it was to be left to the Europeans uh, alone. So we're talking, it's not more about uh, burden sharing, it's more about interoperability. Uh, and, and, and some sort of division of task and of course coordination, mostly on the trade and technology issues where, where Europe can actually have something to say. But yeah. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, thank, thank you very much uh, for your reply. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, all the, uh, uh, what uh, the Europeans, uh, particularly Germans, uh, um, have done vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia uh, was a little bit different from uh, what uh, Japan and other countries are doing. Uh, because I think the uh, Germany was so thankful for the its uh, unification. Uh, that means that the uh, you know the uh, Russia never never said no, and so so, so Germany was uh, really really upset and uh, you know the uh, thankful for, for for Russia, you know, and uh, so I think this is a quite different degree, uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, uh, France and other countries, uh, and also the energy. I think uh, we yes Japan is also. Uh, Partly dependent on uh, you know Sahalin and so, on, but it's not such a huge uh, amount. Uh, you know the in case of uh, you know the you know, the uh, Russia, I think forty percent of the you know gas and uh, oil are coming from Russia. We have only you know, you know some uh, less than ten percent, uh, or even even even, even uh, less. And uh, so that uh, the degree is so different, and uh, we are not uh, appeasing uh, Russia, you know, at at all. Never, and uh, we, uh, you know, have a, uh, you know, sort of kind of the, uh, you know, the uh, still the uh, territorial disputes and ter territorial negotiations. We don't have any uh, peace treaty uh, with Russia, uh, so there is no, no, no reason for for Japan to, uh, you know, appease Russia. And four islands were occupied, you know, and uh, uh, so uh, for what reason uh, Japan should should not appease Russia? But uh, the in case of Russia, uh, Germany, and uh, Europe. Uh, almost everything, uh, you know, uh, has been, uh, you know, solved uh, with regard to the, uh, you know, territorial issues and so on and so forth. But we have this one. This is totally different. Please don't mix up. Yeah. No uh, appeasement whatsoever in case of the uh, you know, Japanese foreign policy towards Russia. Of course, tactics is something there to, uh, you know, the uh, make the negotiation more smooth. We have to make also compromise, but no appeasement. Uh, so don't mix it up. And also, I would like to say that Ukraine, uh, who said no to the uh, accession of Ukraine in 2014, at the time of the uh, Bucharest, uh, you know, NATO, NATO meeting, the United States want to have the uh, Ukraine as member of the NATO, but there are two countries who, who said no. Uh, uh, you know, that was France and, and Germany. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, those are very uh, clear that uh, the uh, in, in in whose name uh, you know the uh, France and Germany wanted to speak you you ignored the interest of the uh, you know the uh, Ukraine in those days uh, and uh, so I think the uh, to some extent Europe has responsibility uh, you know for Ukraine uh, becoming that kind of thing and uh, uh, of course, we don't do not uh, you know the uh, the uh, uh, say uh, okay for the uh, you know the position of Russia. No, never, uh, uh, never is the case. In that sense, we are same. We have the same perception. We have the same concept, and we are fully supporting NATO. And uh, that is very clear because you know Prime Minister uh, participated in NATO summit meeting, share the same uh, uh, almost same uh, you know the uh, 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 threat perception. Uh, against Russia and uh, against uh, China. So we share that kind of a perception, threat perception with NATO. Yeah, NATO is enemy for Europe. Yeah, she declared it's a threat. China is a challenge. So this is the uh, perception NATO new strategy. You know, and Japan also almost uh, share this, this, uh, you know, the uh, uh, common concept uh, so that, uh, you know, the uh, appeasement 
uh, maybe I think uh, I have uh, uh, said uh, in a very strong uh, you know, way, uh, it could be something between appeasement and, and uh, uh, you know, the uh, sufficing the uh, self, uh, national interest, maybe something in between. And uh, that kind of thing is, of course, necessary uh, for all countries. So I agree. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, people try and European countries sometimes tend to think more proactively and uh, cooperatively with Russia under the Putin's uh, regime. It was a wake up call. It's a wake up call. And, uh, you know, so I think uh, uh, I hope that the, uh, you know, the uh, some uh, 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 different uh, kind, kind of the uh, coordination and also the framework setting uh, is necessary for Russia. Uh, I think the, uh, you, you cannot say that, uh, you know, nothing has happened uh, as if, uh, you know, everything is over, uh, as if uh, Russia become uh, is in, uh, once again a new, uh, the uh, uh, normal member of the, uh, the European House. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I really don't know what that should be the case. Uh, well, uh, so this is uh, uh, something, and also the same kind of thing could be said for the, uh, you know, the structure of the United Nations Security Council. So nothing has happened with regard to the Security Council. What is the uh, succession of the, uh, you know, the Russia of, uh, you know, former Soviet Union in uh, 1992, uh, saying that, uh, you know, Russia is a successive country uh, of the, uh, you know, former Soviet Union. And then uh, who recognized this? It was uh, recognized by the, uh, you know, the former Soviet Union uh, members, uh, but uh, no discussion was, uh, was held in the United Nations. Is it an uh, automatic succession? Why? Russia became a different country, a smaller country succeeded. And uh, so I think uh, this kind of the discussions could be also could be made, whether the succession of the permanent membership was legal, correctly done. But uh, the, uh, the permanent members of the Security Council carefully avoid, because if you do this, you will open Pandora's box. And of course, the other countries, including France and, and Britain, will be said, are you rightly sitting uh, in the Security Council? Yeah. So you, you, uh, France and, and, and Britain, are very carefully avoiding this kind of these discussions and uh, complying with the uh, request of the uh, you know other countries to reform. And France and and and, and Britain uh, are very forthcoming in that sense. Uh, we appreciate very much. But of course, uh, this is also the national interest of you, yours. Uh, but uh, something must be must must be must be done in the name of the uh, you know the uh, uh, such a country like U Ukraine, you know, nothing has happened with regard to the status of the Security Council uh, membership, particularly the public members, and that should be done. But uh, you know, but uh, the change the uh, reform of the Security Council, uh, in my view, should not include that kind of dis discussions. If you include this, I think nothing will move. So that we should perhaps uh, leave, uh, you know, the uh, this this uh, question, uh, uh, you know, the uh, what shall I say, uh, left on the table and uh, not discussing uh, right now, uh, and uh, you know, go uh, the uh, feasible uh, reform of the Security Council, and that is not challenging the status of the you know permanent members of the Security Council, but slightly challenging the uh, veto. We should uh, restrict re veto. Now is the best time to do this and uh, uh, introduce the, uh, you know, semi-permanent members of the Security Council, something in between. That should be, should, should be the case. Okay, um, I have one question that I will relay uh, from uh, Professor Sheldon Duplay, who is a great uh, specialist and we know on uh, maritime uh, security and issues and uh, naval security and um, issues. And he's asking a slightly, uh, not controversial, but uh, uh, this is something that has been debated a lot, especially in, in Asia. Can you fight to, I mean, out of the context of the Ukraine war, this is something that was debated before the Ukraine war, particularly in Japan. Is it possible to fight two tigers at the same time? Meaning, can you focus both at the same time on China and Russia, or would it be uh, more um, um, astute in a way to try to 
uh, wage, uh, put a wage between Russia and China, avoid a full uh, alliance between the two and try to use Russia against China in other way to do a 1971 Nixon visit uh, to China in reverse, um, which in my, in, in my analysis made sense. But of course, Ukraine war changed all this. And this, is, this was, of course, also the policy of Prime Minister Abe. I mean, uh, he, many people said he, he, he visited Russia and he had so many contacts with uh, Putin. But of course, it was related to what you mentioned, the illegal occupation of northern territories by uh, Russia since 1945. But also, his uh, strategic vision and thinking was well, we have to choose. Um, for Japan, the main challenge, threat, whatever, is China. And maybe we can avoid an alliance between China and Russia. Because of Ukraine war, it's very controversial to mention that, but I tend to think that in the future, when that thing in Europe is solved, this is still an issue. I mean, and of course, I agree, Eva, that there, is, uh, there are many, many convergences between Russia and China. I fully agree with you. This is in their common interest to present a, a, a common, a united front against the West or Western uh, democracies. Still, I think that China is focused only on its own interest. And that if Russia is useful, okay. If you need to show that you have good relationship with Russia against the US and the West, okay. If you need to really support a failing state, a little bit like China was during the Cultural Revolution, one thing, you know, when Mao was saying uh, US, uh, the atomic bomb is a paper, uh, tiger, paper tiger, whatever, and whatever, if we use it, it's not important. And Russia were absolutely, scandalized by that, by that kind of irresponsible position. And now it's uh, the reverse again. And China will be ready to show that they have a, a very strong relationship with Russia, but they will only fight for themselves, for their own interest. And it leads me to the last complexity of that situation is that Ukraine and Europe or even Japan or the US expecting Russia to do, to play a positive role putting pressure on Russia, on Ukraine, it gives Russia, China an importance and a say that it should not have in the global uh, situation. And I don't think they will play a positive role. They will just like with North Korea, lead us to imagine that China is a major actor and that we need China's support at the cost of making concessions or whatever. So this is another danger that, that we have to, say, to face. Plus the fact that on Ukraine, again, Ukraine has a very ambiguous position regarding China. Uh, there was a vote at the uh, committee of uh, Human Rights Committee of the UN on Xinjiang, and Ukraine abstained initially. President uh, Zelensky said many times that, yeah, it would be better for to get more support from China, but they understand. And I'm sure China would be more than ready to go to Ukraine and participate to reconstruction after the war. And it, it may happen. Ukraine was one of the main partners of China before the war in the Belt and Road Initiative. So things are extremely complex. And uh, this is again why we need to exchange among like-minded <laughs> thinkers, countries, whatever, because the role of China, Russia, in the longer term, even Ukraine, even some other countries in Europe is extremely complex or much more than, again, uh, France and Germany on one side and all the other good guys <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> I'm just joking here, but it's just... Um, Okay, Eva, do you want to add something to conclude, uh, maybe, and then we will close that one table. Yeah, no, just very quickly, I pretty much agree, but I would be quite skeptical on trying to push these two apart. Uh, you're absolutely right, we're talking about two great powers, 
two, two great historical uh, powers. We can discuss one is declining, one is, one is ascending, whatever. But it is mentality wise is of course, think for yourself first. And that, that's the case for, for, for any and even more so for, for China and Russia. But while I'm uh, more skeptical shifting them apart is to look on um, the so-called global south and the sort of interactions that we see, for instance, in Africa. I think that the mutual needs uh, for now, at least, uh, overweight uh, th those. I mean, they are mutually, they are needed. This partnership is needed for their own national uh, sovereign interests as it stands. So as long as, uh, you know, beyond the sort of ideational um, rejections of the Western rules-based order, which is very, very strong in the narrative, which is going, you know, probably here to stay, especially with, with NATO getting a little bit more grounds, um, I um, would be skeptical uh, to see the couple falling apart, uh, I mean, in any time soon, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so Eva, thank you very much. And uh, also to Professor Takashiro Shinyo for your uh, presentations. And uh, now I will switch to the last third round table of that web conference and give the floor for moderation to uh, Olivier Kempf. Thank you very much. And then maybe at the end of that third round table, I will just come back to say thank you to everyone. So now the floor is yours, Olivier, for the thank third you. round table. Uh, I will uh, immediately uh, maybe give the floor to the speakers and um, starting with uh, Professor uh, Isobe that we just heard during the first round table. Professor Azobe, are you here? Yes. So, yes. sorry, <laughs> it's a very strange uh, web conference today. This is the first time it happens. So I will uh, give you the floor to immediately uh, begin uh, with your presentation for the last uh, round table. And then after that, as uh, before, you have 12, 15, 20 minutes. And then I will give the floor to Nathalie Loiseau. And then we will have some discussion. Thank you very much. So Professor Isobe, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Valerie. Um, bonjour and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation uh, to the French Foundation for Strategic Research uh, for inviting me to this uh, prestigious uh, webinar. Uh, let me uh, share my slide. Okay, so my name is Koichi Sobe, a retired Lieutenant General of the Japan Grand Self-Defense Force. I am deeply uh, delighted to discuss the agenda with Honorable Natalie Lozwa and General Olivier Kemp. While in active duty, I served various staff and command duties, and I have been involved in the development of national defense program guidelines and the Japan US Alliance coordination in joint and ground staff offices, as well as actual self defense force operations as commanded. When I was offered this opportunity to make a remark at the third round table on cybersecurity, supply chain, and information warfare, how to improve resilience. I was a little bit puzzled to respond to because I'm neither an expert in cybersecurity, supply chain, nor information warfare. But I determined to join this web conference because I thought that Japan's new national strategy, my uh, strategy and its uh, subordinate strategies themselves might be a direct answer to this agenda. Next slide, please. These three strategy documents were adopted as policy document at the cabinet meeting on December 16, 2022, last year. Explaining that Japan's new three strategy documents, namely National Security Strategy, NSS, the National Defense Strategy, NDS, and Defense Build-Up Program, the 
BP could help understand the Japan's geostrategic position and how Japan is going to proactively deter possible contingencies and to improve its resiliency by collaborating with its ally and like-minded countries. Next slide, please. First, I would like to talk about Japan's recognition of the security environment. Next, I will raise four observations of the three strategy documents from my perspective. Then touch upon cybersecurity. And finally, I would like to point out future issues. First of all, when I first read the three strategy documents, I felt that they are excellent policy decisions. I would like to express my respect for the efforts of those involved in the formulation of the three documents. These are extremely ambitious. In the past, for more than a half century, the Japanese government had postponed decisions that could be adopted constitutionally in the field of national security and defense. However, this time it has made a major change. Notable examples of this are counter strike capability, drastic increase of defense spending to 2% of GDP within the next five years, and active cyber defense. The reason why the government came to this decision, I believe, is fundamentally rooted in our recognition that we are on the brink of contingency. Next slide, please. At the outset, the NSS expressed its recognition that Japan's security environment is as severe and complex as it has been since the end of the World War II. The possibility cannot be precluded that a similar serious situation like Russia's invasion to Ukraine may arise in the future in the Indo-Pacific, especially in East Asia. It clearly states a sense of urgency. The time is ticking. In the vicinity of Japan, military buildups, including of nuclear weapons and missiles, are rapidly advancing, coupled with mounting pressures by unilaterally changing the status quo by force. Moreover, based on situations of uh, territories, cross-border cyber attacks on critical civilian infrastructures and information warfare through spread of disinformation are constantly taking place. The NSS defines China as an unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge. North Korea, an even more grave and imminent threat to Japan's national security than ever before. Russia, a strong security concern coupled with its strategic cooperation with China. There are many features I would like to raise in the three strategy documents. Among these, I would like to highlight the following four observations. Next slide, please. First, combined with the geostrategic situation, the Japanese government has recognized that the boundaries between peacetime and contingency, or military and non-military, are blurring. The NSS directly states that blurring the boundary between these is no longer clear-cut either. This recognition is due to lessons learned from hybrid warfare such as the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and gray zone situations in the South China Sea. In the past, Japan had the tendency to draw a clear line between peace and war or military and non-military. I think we need to overcome it. This tendency is due to that clear distinction between the two makes policymakers easily handling an issue. This dis distinction makes clarifying the scope of activities of the self-defense force and thus operating them on a limited basis. However, such reasoning no longer applies. 
China is employing civil military fusion strategy. They have no boundaries between these. Blurring the boundaries makes the Japanese government to respond to crisis in an orchestrated manner. We are in the world of a historical inflection point. Second is the whole of government approach. Blurring the boundaries makes the government to proceed promptly to employ all available national resources to achieve the national security objectives. The NSS states that Japan will implement strategic approaches to achieve its national security objectives, harnessing its comprehensive national power as an integrated and efficient means. Let me introduce you several examples of the government's effort for orchestration. One is coordination and cooperation between the self-defense force and the Japan Coast Guard, including control over the Coast Guard by the defense minister in the event of a contingency. Second is restructuring the National Cyber Security Center. We call it NISC. It will be constructively restructured to establish a new organization which will comprehensively coordinate policies in the field of cybersecurity in a centralized manner. I think everyone is aware of DINE, diplomacy, information, military, and economy. The Japanese government's strategic approach added technology to this traditional DINE. NSS explains technology aspect as follows. The creation of science, technology, and innovation is the source of Japan's own economic and social development. In addition, the appropriate use of technological capabilities plays a crucial role in improving Japan's national security environment and is also indispensable in addressing global issues such as climate change. Japan will actively capitalize on its advanced technological capabilities developed over the years in the public and private sectors in the field of national security without being bound by its conventional way of thinking. The government's holistic approach would be accelerated from now on. Upon third is the capability-based defense buildup idea. The national defense strategy clearly says that Japan needs to squarely face the grim reality and fundamentally reinforce Japan's defense capabilities with a focus on opponent capabilities and new ways of warfare. This may seem obvious to many audiences, but I believe it's a pivotal change in Japan. Until then, the successive national defense program guidelines had not explicitly stated that they would target the opponent's capabilities. This is the first time this phrase has been used in Japan's national defense policy document. In light of the opponent's military capabilities, the current defense capability is not effective enough to determine. So it is necessary to rapidly strengthen defense capabilities. As a result of focusing on the opponent's capabilities, seven emphases are indicated. Next slide, please. These are standoff defense capabilities, integrated air defense capabilities, air and missile defense capabilities, unmanned defense capabilities, cross domain operation capabilities, and command and control and intelligence mobile deployment capabilities and civil protection and sustainability and resiliency. Next slide, please. The underlying strategic approach in the strategy documents lies in three layers, efforts by itself, efforts with ally, and efforts with like-minded countries. As a major player in the Indo-Pacific, the strategy emphasizes working with ally and like-minded countries to maintain order under the policy of proactive contribution to peace. 
It is a difficult time to ensure security on one's own. Cooperation with the US, Asian and European friends, including the EU and NATO, are indispensable for the peace and stability of the region and beyond. The NSS emphasizes that as a major global actor, Japan will join together with its ally, like-minded countries and others to achieve a new balance in international relations, especially in the Indo-Pacific region. In doing so, Japan will prevent the emergence of situation in which any one state can unilaterally change the status quo easily and redouble efforts to secure a stable, predictable, free and open international order based on the rule of law. Uh, could you, next slide, please. I'm touching on the last bullet, fourth one. To enhance the engagement with like-minded countries, including Europe, EU, and NATO, Japan will do so through the following measures. Next slide, please. Bilateral and multilateral dialogue, bilateral training and exercise, conclusion of information protection agreements, acquisition and cross-servicing agreement, and reciprocal access agreement, joint development of defense equipment, transfer of defense equipment and technology, capacity building support, strategic communication, and flexible deterrence options. Next slide, please. A great example is Prime Minister Kishida and President Macron's meeting on January 10th. The two leaders highlighted challenges, including security, where they can increase cooperation. The leaders looked to a new round of joint military exercises, as well as Japan's establishment of a consulate in France's New Caledonia Islands, which marks deeper cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. Next slide. Another example is joint development of next generation fighter aircraft among Japan, the UK, and Italy. The agreement was made on December 9th last year, just one month ago. Next slide, please. As for reciprocal access agreement, the UK and Japan signed this agreement that would remove obstacles to holding joint military exercises in either country. Besides Japan-US security treaty that allows US troops to be stationed on its territory, Japan has a similar agreement with Australia. We are in an era of collaboration. Next slide, please. I would like to touch upon cybersecurity issues. Take cybersecurity, for instance, as shown on the slide. You can easily understand how these four features are closely connected to the cybersecurity. Cyber is borderless. It can penetrate everywhere, every domain. That's why we need a whole of government approach. The Japanese government decisively engaged active cyber defense from now on. We need to accurately grasp the opponent's cyber capability. The capabilities in this field are malicious and robust. Multilateral cooperation is critical for cyber security. Next. In the cybersecurity arena, the government will advance efforts to consider to realize necessary measures, including the following points. Japan will advance efforts on information sharing to the government in case of cyber attacks among the private sector, including critical infrastructure, as well as coordinating and supporting incident response activities for the private sector. Japan will take necessary actions to detect servers and others suspected of being abused by attackers by utilizing information on communication services 
which are provided by domestic telecommunications providers. For serious cyber attacks that pose security concerns against the government, critical infrastructures and others, the government will, given, will be given the necessary authorities that allow it to penetrate and neutralize attackers, servers, and others in advance to the extent possible. In order to realize and uh, promote these efforts, including active cyber defense, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the National Center for Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity, NISC, will be constructively restructured to establish a new organization which will comprehensively coordinate policies in the field of cybersecurity in a centralized manner. And next slide, please. Finally, let me raise future issues. The three strategy documents are very ambitious. It is of utmost importance to put this into practice. Time does not wait. The following four points I would like to make emphasis on. First, the measures described in the documents entail division or enactment of the relevant laws. The government should prepare to submit acts to the coming diet session. Second, in order to implement measures, it is imperative to allocate the necessary funding. Third, to foster a mindset in which the government tackle with as a whole. The state of the stovepipe should be no longer existential. Finally, the government should deliberately explain why it is necessary to implement these strategies in order to gain the public support. Uh, this concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, General, uh, for this uh, comprehensive uh, key keynote. Uh, um, I, I apologize for coming late, but uh, a, a sudden disconnect of my liaison was with you on Zoom. So I'm sorry for that. I hope that uh, Valerie made the uh, initial introduction to uh, General Isobe. Uh, thank you very much, General, for your, for your presentation, for your introduction of the National Security Strategy and especially what uh, deals with cyber, which is part of our panel uh, dealing with resilience. Now, <clears throat> let's turn to uh, Nathalie Loiseau. Uh, she was a, a former minister. She's currently a member of the European Parliament. Uh, what can you tell us, uh, Minister, about uh, resilience in terms of cyber, in terms of supply chain, in terms of information war and that kind of things that uh, uh, everybody was talking of resilience and 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 hybrid warfare in the past years but uh, uh, in the environment of uh, the war in ukraine what uh, do these words tell you and what could you tell us about these words well first of all thank you very much for having me on this panel uh, and thank you for the kind introduction Indeed, uh, uh, in the European Parliament, I chair the Defence Committee and uh, I also work on foreign interferences in our democracies. So um, I'm very much uh, interested in, in this panel and I listen carefully to Professor Isope and I, I agree with the number of things he said on the remedies to the current situation. And what the current situation is, well, actually there is a world war going on and I'm not talking about Ukraine or not Ukraine only. Uh, even if I will have to refer to Ukraine later uh, in my introduction. But I'm talking about hybrid warfare because hybrid warfare is war. And for too long, we thought we talked about uh, hybrid threats where we already had hybrid attacks going on. Uh, it's ongoing and it's massive. It's, it's under our eyes, but we still hardly notice. So what does characterize a uh, hybrid warfare? Be it cyber attacks, info wars, but also elite capture, uh, pressure on diasporas, interference in, in elections, pressure on universities and think tanks, weaponization of migrants, weaponization of energy, you name it. All of them have one thing in common. Their authors 
almost never claim responsibility for what they do. Uh, and when we talk about authors, um, it's basically authoritarian regimes. Russia, China, but also Turkey, Iran, North Korea. You notice that I named a NATO member, which is a challenge. And I quoted two countries in Asia. But at the same time, this comment is completely irrelevant because hybrid warfare, no, no border, no geography, uh, no difference between state and non-state actors, or at least it blurs the differences between public and private sector, and finally between war and peace. So what are these authoritarian regimes fighting against? Uh, well, they are fighting against us, against us liberal democracies, not for what we do, but for what we are, liberal democracies. They hate what we are because we are a competitor in terms of uh, political uh, choice. We are open, we are free, we are democratic, we are liberal and we are successful and resilient. Resilient to financial crisis, resilient to um, pandemics, resilient or at least prepared to tackle uh, climate change much more than authoritarian regimes. Although you remember the narrative at the beginning of the COVID pandemic that only autocracies would be able to uh, fight against such health challenges. And finally, uh, democracies perform much better than autocracies. So they try to exploit or divide to make us weaker and to make us believe that our model is not functional. Uh, and they exploit differences of opinion which are in the open uh, in democracies. So they try to trigger bitter splits and they try to discredit the way uh, we handle uh, the challenges. Uh, they also favor radical political parties because these radical political parties don't have interest in the proper functioning of democracies. Uh, and it goes as far as um, having a role in the assault on Capitol Hill having a role on the uh, assault of a political institution in Brasilia a few days ago. And you may remember yellow vests in France. Of course, if there was a national, local uh, origin of all these phenomena. But all these phenomena were amplified from outside by info war, by disinformation, by trolls, by boats, by um, state media like Russia Today at the time, for instance. Um, one thing strikes me is that China is more and more using Russia's methods. Uh, we've seen China starting by promoting China as it is. And then we saw China using disinformation, especially uh, uh, on COVID, uh, helping Russia uh, on uh, Ukraine disinformation and Ukraine war narrative. Um, we've seen war wolves. We've seen a lot of arrogance and aggressiveness from China uh, towards the West, but that there might be a very recent change about it. We've seen that uh, the, the, the most vocal proponent of uh, war wolves are being demoted. We've seen new uh, figures being promoted and maybe a change of tone from China in its public diplomacy that might very well be just because they uh, realize that copying Russia doesn't provide success, at least in terms of public communication. I'm certain that the objectives remain the same that um, partnership remains very strong between Russia and China, but China is very pragmatic. If something doesn't work, they, doesn't use it. they don't use it. So how to fight against it? How to answer your questions about resilience uh, against cyber attacks, 
against all these forms of hybrid warfare. Uh, the first thing is being what we are, remaining de democratic, liberal, open, because it makes us more agile. It makes us more adaptable. But we have to be more determined, more united, and less naive. Uh, I fully agree with this notion of whole of society approach. Uh, we've seen it in Taiwan. We're uh, fighting against uh, cyber attacks, fighting against uh, disinformation. is not only uh, the remit of the state, it's the remit of every single citizen. And the floor is given to uh, single citizens, is given to NGOs, is given to civil, civil society. It starts with media literacy. Uh, it starts with a good understanding of what comes to our screens and how individually we have to be prepared to protect ourselves in terms of cyber, cyber security. Cyber security has to be promoted by the state, but it has to be understood and implemented at the level of SMEs to begin with, because this is very often the uh, weak part of our society. Um, we have to uh, work with uh, fact checkers, professional journalists, people who have become specialists of um, open source intelligence. We have to nurture this ecosystem, but not to make it um, vertical. Its uh, efficiency is because it's horizontal. It's because it's diverse. We see that right now, OSINT specialists, in a way, they compete with intelligence agencies because they provide information about what's happening, where, and who's behind a, 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 an event. But that's a very positive competition. We have to keep this sort of competition. But we also have to be ready to regulate. And first of all, to regulate uh, cyberspace, to regulate internet. This is what the European Union has been starting doing with Digital Market Act and especially Digital Service Act to make sure that we can fight against disinformation, making uh, the big platform responsible for the means they use and the results they get. And if they don't provide sufficient means and they don't reach sufficient goals, they are sanctioned. So that's the first start and it's an important one. Uh, we also regulated uh, in terms of cyber security with the directive on uh, security of network and information systems, the NIS directive, now it's become the NIS 2, to make sure that member states, but also private companies do more, say more what's taking place when there is a cyber attack, don't keep it for yourself, make sure that others know about it, Make sure that if you see something, others know about it. So we fight together uh, and we uh, deter and we prevent together. Uh, there is also a new regulation in the making Cyber Resilience Act. Very simple, but very necessary. It means that cyber there are secu cyber security requirements for products with digital elements if they want to be circulated in the single market. We have this power of being the biggest affordable uh, single market, and we have to use it. If you want to sell uh, connected devices in Europe, they have to have cyber security included, and they have to be regularly updated. Otherwise, they would lose their certification for being sold in the single market. This will be a very powerful tool. We also have, and on this, I also fully agree with Prof Professor Sibe, Isobe, sorry. We have to choose carefully our partners. I just spoke about the EU level because it's a relevant level in terms of size and in terms of common interest. Of course, NATO is also a good level, but you remember that I quoted Turkey as being a troublemaker in InfoWars, in using diasporas, in using migrants as weapons, uh, in having 
an ambiguous relationship with Russia uh, and probably in circumventing current sanctions against Russia. Um, this one of the elephants in NATO's room, the other being the choices made by America. If we always depend on the result of elections somewhere in Iowa or uh, in, in one of the swing states, that might be a problem because we might not necessarily have the same sense of urgency on all the uh, conflicts, all the authors of hybrid warfare. So we should, of course, fully engage in NATO and at the same time, be aware that it's not always on every conflict, on every author, the most appropriate answer. And we have to have a second answer in our uh, pockets. But um, we also have to reach out to every single liberal democracy. I don't like the term like-minded because if you only talk to people who think like you think, usually um, doesn't make you more intelligent. But at some point, we used to talk about the free world. And I'm afraid that this notion becomes relevant again. That means that working with Japan is a no-brainer. Of course, we have to. Working with Taiwan, we have to. Working with Australia, we have to. Learning from good practices. And I uh, heard very interesting things from the uh, new uh, security strategy from Japan even this capacity to retaliate against uh, cyber attackers is, is very uh, important. We have to make sure that uh, we cannot be dependent on dictatorships for essential goods. Uh, and we have seen it firsthand with energy and Russia. We could have noticed before, but now that we know, we cannot repeat this sort of dependency. So of course, supply chains uh, first for military equipment, and it's not a given. That's not that obvious that we are not dependent. So we have to work much more um, on these supply chains. But we cannot be dependent either on private companies if they cannot demonstrate that they are 100% reliable. And there, uh, there's a big lesson learned from Ukraine, and this is Starlink. Because we know how important Stalin has been and still is for Ukraine to be able to communicate in a situation where uh, Ukraine is. But we also know, we heard Elon Musk saying, well, I wonder, I don't know whether Stalin can always be available in regions claimed by Russia. After all, should I do it or shouldn't I do it? And the very fact that Ukraine is dependent on uh, the goodwill of the owner of a company is of course a huge vulnerability. And we all have to reflect about it and think about our own constellations of satellites, but also the kind of regulations, once again, that we uh, impose on private companies so that we don't depend on uh, very uh, unpredictable personal decisions. A few more lessons learned from Ukraine. Uh, first of all, um, there is one thing I hear and read all the time, and I would like to echo a, a, a big warning. People tend to say, well, after all, cyber was not so important in the war in Ukraine, less important than what we had expected. There were not that many cyber attacks. Guys, wake up. The first thing we noticed in Europe on February 24, last year, the day Russia attacked Ukraine, was a massive cyber attack on information system of a European company working with Udelsat and providing um, communication for European uh, infrastructures, and of course for Ukraine. That was the first signal of the war. It was a huge cyber attack. Since then, of course, uh, resilience has been put in place, cybersecurity has been strengthened, but it happened. There are more symbolic cyber attacks the moment we in the European Parliament voted in favor of recognizing 
Holodomor uh, as a genocide, there was a huge cyber attack on, on the European Parliament. This is symbolic, even if it's a problem. But um, there has been a cyber attack on Ukraine every single day since last year. And the only th reason why Ukraine was able to survive these cyber attacks was that there was massive partnership from United States and from Europe and a very talented, I would say, cy uh, Ukrainian cyber defense. But it's because we are constantly joining forces to support Ukraine that cyber has not been such a big problem and it remains a threat. Of course, we see that Russia can strike hard, but hardly stay the course in cyber attacks. Okay, but they are learning from their mistakes uh, as we are all. So let's not state that cyber is not that important. It's still very much in the, in the landscape. Uh, another um, lesson that we have to learn from Ukraine is well, hybrid leads to conventional. Hybrid warfare is not necessarily a substitute to conventional warfare. It can only be the starter, the appetizer, or the complementary uh, instrument. Because after all, if, of course, conventional warfare is more harmful. And we see that in Ukraine, it started with hybrid in 2014. And now we are in a very conventional warfare. Look at Armenia. It's exactly the same. It started with convention, with, with hybrid, with info wars, with cyber attacks. And now Azerbaijan uh, went to uh, full conventional warfare in 2020, went again last year in September against internationally recognized territory of uh, Armenia, and it goes on and on. And of course, the question now is Taiwan. And Ukraine is important for Taiwan because I'm sure that China will draw the lessons if Ukraine wins and draw the lessons if Ukraine loses. So there's no doubt that we have to be fully aware of the importance of Ukraine for the rest of the world. But of course, we know that Global South is not a given. We know that Global South uh, is not necessarily supportive. And once again, it is not necessarily supportive because it has been the theater of hybrid warfare for quite a long time. We know it for certain, we French in Sahel, where info wars uh, have been going on. And on this, we are, have not been good. We are very poor at communication. We are always reactive, never proactive. And this is where it has to change. This is where I will stop. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. You saw maybe sh me showing uh, my 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 clock. Uh, thank you very much, Madame Loiseau, for this uh, comprehensive uh, uh, keynote. Uh, thank you for covering the 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 entire topic, uh, not only cyber but uh, uh, sub uh, you know, supply chains and info wars as well. Uh, generally, Sobe, maybe you have seen on the discussion on the Q and A part of uh, our Zoom session that there has been questions and answers on the info wars, uh, info wars uh, against Japan. So uh, maybe you can elaborate on that. I, I know that uh, both of uh, EU and Japan uh, have developed uh, a strong. Uh, strong uh, tools in terms of cyber. Maybe EU is uh, is more advanced. Uh, if I refer to NMA and DA Nice uh, two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but what I noticed to what you said, uh, uh, General Isobe, is that the, uh, the government of Japan uh, authorized to 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 repulse, to react to any um, uh, aggression, and this uh, feels uh, as being something new as a kind of offensive or at, at least an active defense in terms of cyber, not just defensive, but some somehow offensive, which is something new in your uh, na new national security strategy. Uh, if I pass to supply chains, uh, 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 the, the topic uh, emerged two years ago with the pandemic, I remember, because there were a kind of blockade, uh, natural blockade due to pandemia. 
uh, there may be uh, some uh, things uh, following up with uh, what's currently going on in in, in China and uh, in Europe. So maybe this uh, this this uh, affects what you see uh, you in Japan. Uh, we in Europe we see uh, the the issue of. Uh, Oil and gas, you know, uh, or what we imported from from Russia that we cannot import anymore for, for sanctions reasons. Uh, so uh, maybe you have a, a few words to say about this topic of supply chain very quickly. And uh, because uh, I hope that Professor Takamizawe joined us, and maybe we can give him a, a, a five minutes time. So. Uh, uh, General Isobe, do you have two minutes on, on the supply chain issue? And Madame Rosso, two minutes as well. And then five, ten minutes to Professor Takamisawe. Uh, General Isobe, yours, floor is yours. Uh, General Kemp, thank you very much uh, uh, for giving me a time. Uh, about the cyber security, of course, the active cyber defense is a new challenge. And it could uh, uh, conflict with the current uh, regulations on the Constitution. So I think we need to revise uh, uh, the current uh, laws, especially the uh, the Constitution says that the confid confidentiality communications uh, in the separated in Article 21. So I think we need to uh, produce an idea to to active actively uh, conduct the active cyber defense. And about the resilience, I think uh, Japan is very vulnerable because Japan are heavily uh, dependent on natural resources and food overseas. So the procurement and manufacturing and sales and consumption. So this a series of line, uh, we need to have uh, alternative or diverse means. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Takamisa Watts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Isobe. Uh, Nathalie Loiseau, uh, the, a few words about this in terms of resilience in supply chains, maybe not in uh, raw materials, but uh, other things as well. Well, um, now we know. Um, and uh, we know uh, the hard way, of course, about energy. We are focusing on it right now, but not only. Chips is, of course, uh, one of the key issues. Um, and the uh, CHIPS Act uh, that the European Union is working on is a, is a response to, to, to this uh, concern. Rare earth is, of course, a, another issue. And we see China very active on this. Um, we have to um, trigger uh, more investment, even in Europe, because we realize that uh, we have assets that we have not used yet. But let's remember that in Ukraine, we saw that food, simply food, was a, 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 a challenge. Um, and on this, yes, we were able to, to, to fight and finally open corridors. But the capacity uh, to have safe routes for food is a key issue. It means that the EU being a, a very comprehensive uh, organization can tackle this different priority better than a military alliance or in a complementary way, but still uh, uh, having safe maritime routes as soon as we talk about supply chains is a military priority as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I have now to, to thank uh, General Isabe and you, Madame Loiseau, for your uh, tremendous and uh, challenging uh, keynotes. It was very, very useful, very interesting, and uh, I hope that uh, there will be further discussions among, uh, among us. I don't know if there are questions. I, I don't see any written questions. So maybe now I have to pass the floor to Valérie Niquet so that she, she, she can make a, a general conclusion of the entire uh, seminar. Uh, Valérie? 
Yes, no, very briefly, I will not make a long conclusion of this uh, web conference. As it was been mentioned initially, this is part of our Japan program at FRS, and we, we try to uh, support and uh, increase the dialogue between uh, Japan, France, Europe, uh, with participants from both sides. And I think it is extremely important in order to correct some misperception we might have, a lot of misperceptions in Europe on what Japan can do or cannot do, and uh, the difficulties it has uh, in um, and this evolution of the national security is extremely important, but we must also see the limit of that. But also these perceptions maybe on the part of Japan regarding the recent evolutions in the last few years of European countries, and even in France and Germany, as I said before, regarding, uh, um, regarding uh, China or Russia. And maybe correct also a little bit some misperceptions about uh, the different roles of European countries between the UK on one side and EU, European countries on the other side. And I think all this shows that we need to go on and pursue that dialogue and then it's uh, extremely positive in that way. So let me, the last word would be to thank all the speakers uh, um, and moderators uh, for this web conference. I'm three hours is a little, little bit long, but we wanted to invite um, people, enough people from Japan for it to be interesting. And um, we will have another smaller webinar uh, next month in February, but you will re all receive an invitation to listen to it if you want. And I also want to, to thank the participants who, who were there uh, for the whole time. And uh, thank you again, and see you for another conference of the Japan program at FRS. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.